eyeball and then just work my way down. It's disgusting. So wait, are we in? Oh, tell me, you always surprise me on that. You never tell me. Uh, all right, hello, D&D fans. Uh, we are back for day three of Comic-Con. Uh, I'm Nathan Stewart. Hopefully you know that by now. And you might know my guests, you might not, but they were definitely with us at the stream of many eyes. And we will start with Mr. Michael Whitwer. Hello. Uh, all right, and then we've got John Peterson. Uh, and at the end, Kyle Newman, uh, also famous uh, for his chili. Uh, mm, yeah, no, it's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> all right, so these gentlemen are working on the Art and Arcana, uh, Visual History of Dungeons and Dragons. So let's hold up the, the book. The special edition. Oh, wait, one of those looks bigger than the other one. It that is. is true. It's extra special. Uh, oh, look at that. Secrets. Oh, my God. <laughs> We're the Hydro 74 uh, cover. All right, let's put these down. We're not going to get into this yet because... Before we get into it, there was one thing we forgot to do yesterday, right? Uh, are we ready? Yes. Uh, all right, so yesterday, none of us realized because uh, he's so quiet, but it was Pelham's birthday. What? Uh, so we would like to sing Pelham happy birthday, so we got some cakes. So Pelham, come over on this side. Uh, so if you can come on over. Oh, it's okay. There we go. Here, you squeeze in the center here. Oh, Whoa. please do, yeah. It's a real party. All right, yes. All right I will start us. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Pelham. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> well done. Cupcakes for the our yeah, fine yeah, folks yeah. behind the camera. Oh, you guys want a cupcake? Uh, oh wow! Cupcakes. Oh wow! Yes. Uh, yeah, be good. Nothing yeah. better for, for a live stream than yeah, a cupcake. I agree. Yeah, yeah. that's take how one. I like to do wow. it. I'll take this one over here. Okay, I'm gonna okay. take the wizard hat. Yeah. These are not D and D yeah. themed yeah. cupcakes. They get to wear their but rings. You know what? They're D and D approved. Oh. D and D because those are wizard hats. Oh, exactly. As far as I'm concerned. Obviously, obviously. Let's do this. Um, gonna... Yes. Yeah, so uh, Pelham just quietly comes down. So I, um, I, we were planning Comic Con thing for a while, and then all of a sudden, kind of a couple weeks out, I'm like, I'm getting nervous. Maybe we don't have enough experts on the ground. So I'm like, Pelham, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? You want to come to Comic Con? And of course, says yes, and doesn't even mention, you know, yeah. I mean, I could. I mean, it's my birthday that weekend, but you know, that's cool. Uh, no, he just says yes. So uh, we love him because he always makes sacrifices for us and makes this stuff look easy. We're, we're, um, kind of, we're kind of a can-do atmosphere in general, aren't we? I feel like it. Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. a yes-first atmosphere. Can so do. it's nice. So I uh, I got to see you guys just a few weeks ago at the Stream of Many Eyes. First of all, what do you guys fantastic. think of that? Mm. Oh, Unbelievable. God. What do you guys think of Waterdeep? I mean, you guys were hanging out in Waterdeep, right? Like, I want mean, to live there. I felt like we were in Waterdeep for a couple of days. Yeah. Literally. In Blacksmiths. Waterdeep. Yeah. Oh, you guys were pretty much like right out in front of the blacksmith. Right and the orc butcher, who I thought was perfect. Fancy meat. Yeah. Was, that was, that was and wild. you know, beer at the yawning portal. That was what really that did it. That was pretty awesome. Was just being able to go to the yawning get, portal, get a mug, and, yeah, get a mug, and see Elminster like, there. You know, it's like over on the side they were playing dice. Yeah. As you should be. As you should at the yawning portal. At the yawning portal. Yeah. Um, and then uh, your brother was pretty menacing when we went and like did the intro interview. He like comes out with his cloak <laughs> down, and he's like. Yeah. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. All right. Once before, and he said, I will not cosplay. Yeah? And then oh. he said, we're going live in 30 minutes. And he's like, where's the costume? Who needs the costume? <laughs> no, uh, that's so, real, for real? He was, he was, he was feeling like that. Uh, he was ready. So I think part of the problem is whatever I'm usually wearing seems like I'm fantasy cosplaying yeah, anyway. a little bit. And so, you know, if they didn't, like, you know, then step it, it up, out. then it would stand out. Because I had this, like, corking big gray hat. Yeah. Like, super oversized, like, Don Quixote hat, right? And so... I think that created the obligation on Sam and Kyle. To I think that's what it was. To go in fun. world. Yeah, I thought that was great. No. Um, Let's raise the bar for next year, though. Oh my God. Well, yeah. well, yeah. I think that that event actually is a bar setter for next year, and I have some ideas. Um, Greg Tito has the idea he wants to just do it like a musical. Uh, and I, I vetoed that one. I'm like, no. Like a musical? Like we would all sing? Because no, I'm not yeah. sure that the results would be. I know, I agree. I think he kind of overestimates how the. So we're going to probably be, stick with. This is this is my general. Everything we do in marketing for DD, I like to say, okay, what did we do last time? What's 20% better than that? You're just going to build all spell jammer. 
All spell oh, yeah, I was hoping you'd say that. Oh, oh, thank you. All spell jammer. Right. Here, you got some blue here. Oh, well, no, I was trying to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, a D&D 2000 movie was the idea. M musical spell Oh, jammer, okay, there we go. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think Jeremy Irons is still available. I believe, yes. I, think I heard <laughs> that he bought a castle with the money he got off the last one, so he probably needs to repair said castle oh, now. Yeah. Um, you said mentioned the Don Quixote. Uh, I got to <laughs> one time um, up in Seattle, Fifth Ave, see uh, Man of La Mancha with uh, the guy from Northern Exposure, the bar owner. Okay. Oh, wow. He was fun. I did not <laughs> I know, it. but he was originally uh, a theater. Musical theater guy? Like going back to his roots, huh? He's a musical theater guy? Yeah. And so he was. It, this was like back, I mean, I just knew him, of course, from the old guy marrying the young girl on Northern Exposure. Mike's but. a song and dance guy. Are you? I was, a, I was once dance. a musical theater major. Well, I, I was a musical theater I was. I was. I was um, once a musical theater major. <laughs> so yeah, when you say Don Quixote, I'm like, yeah, once I, I know those songs. Once a musical theater major, always a musical theater yeah. I, my, The first production of that, I saw Robert Goulet play Don Quixote. A, oh a very elderly Robert Goulet play uh -oh. Don Quixote, yeah. I can see that. It didn't have that much energy. It was not... The best production I'd ever it was seen, but I do love Robert Goulet. So and now I know now you're doing it for comedy, but now you just everywhere. got some blue. Now. Uh, am I just okay? Yeah. As long as you well, know, yeah, I don't. It's, we're live though. I don't like care. He, ate, he looks like you ate Cookie Monster. <laughs> here we are. Right he should have come with napkins. I think. Yeah, this so is good. Good. Yeah. 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 No, no, yeah. no, this is good. This is entertainment. Oh, okay. Now you're dead serious. No, I'm not playing. Is it getting that helped? That helped. That helped. Are you there? Okay. Okay, yeah, the cupcakes see. are good, but let's no more cupcakes. <laughs> okay, I'm not good touching anything again. again. Not uh, doing it. Okay, so um, we have a live audience of 12 people. How many people are watching? Okay, so a couple hundred people here watching, and they pretty much tuned in because I told them that you guys are going to show them previews of the book. Yes. Um, so That's a true story. First of all, let's hold up the regular, and is this the regular regular? Because this regular. regular regular looks pretty pretty. I mean, is this like the it's hefty. It's yeah. heavy. It's like the biggest textbook you've ever. Um, and you guys uh, are only selling it for fifty. And and it's like right now it's like forty on Amazon, which is, is kind of stupid. And I, I know I'm biased. I, I know this, but and this thing's Amazon, a lot of book for, for forty Amazon bucks price right now. Lock thing, I think if you pre-order it, you're going to get it at its lowest point ever by the time it comes out. So if it drops down to thirty-five or something, which it may, it's a tremendous so deal. So basically, everyone should rush out right now because just on weight alone, I think this is more than fifty dollars a paper. Hand. Well, I mean, like we tried pounds. to price it like uh, you guys price like the base books, right? We're like, yeah. we should have this be what a PhD. We want it to be comparable to just yeah. with twice as many pages. I was going like to say, but you said how many pages chart, do yes. they do? Okay, well, we're going to do twice. <laughs> that's that's right, that's how right. many maps? Do they, well, we're going to put a map on the inside <laughs> cover. Show that's us it. everyone the inside cover. Oh, yeah. So inside cover. Now, if you can what see this, what camera is the best one to point to? Who's on him best? This one. Okay, this one has the nicest zone, okay. so. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, that's hot. So what that's we have here, of course. That's actually going to be a shirt now. Yeah, well, exactly. The Village of Hamlet, right? Yeah. Brilliant map. Um, and again, something that was selected for the inside cover for a number of reasons, but we happen to have some pretty interesting things on the Village of Hamlet in this book. We do, and we're actually turned to it. Absolutely. We're doing well, reveals. Do. This is Comic-Con, yeah, where you do reveals, reveals of some things, and so... Yeah, this is something from my private stash. Um, I'm a bit of a collector. Maybe start with this. Maybe yeah. talk through about how we talk, treat these dungeons and we can give a little bit more, maybe. I mean, obviously, the Temple of Elemental Evil is a very famous dungeon, and we have a recurring segment that runs through the entire book. We try to show the deadliest dungeons. Obviously, you've got to start with you know, the Tomb of Horrors, the yes. classic death trap dungeon. We take it all the way up to Dead and Kay, to the, to the Doom Vault, mm -hmm. right? Nice. So we want to show kind of how the deadly dungeons evolved over time and how they reference back that original kind of scrappy tournament spirit. But of course, the Temple of Elemental Evil started from this module that came out in 1979, I guess that was, the Village of Hamlet. And if you flip the page here, and this is true of many no. of the modules. Yeah, it's real. What, what you'll discover is that uh, a lot of these came from Gary Gygax's home campaigns. You know, famously, uh, the Tomb of Horrors was something Gary first ran in 1975 at an Origins tournament. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Yeah, I think we will. But the house game, the campaign they ran at TSR in 1976, was actually based around this village of Hamlet. So this is Gary's original hand-drawn map of the village of Hamlet. And if you compare it to the one that's in the end papers, you'll be able to see kind of the, the, the inn of the Welcome Wench, all, all the things you would be yeah. familiar with from the, uh, from the published version of it. And then to the side of that, you see an original hand-drawn sketch of Gary's, again from the same era, from 76, that shows the Temple of Elemental Evil from the outside, yeah. how you get to it, the little road leading down to Hamlet <coughs> that's on it. So we are just so 
enthusiastic about being able to share some of the stuff that, you know, thanks again to um, Wizards being so generous with us and giving us unprecedented uh, access to their archives, but also letting us reprint this stuff that otherwise it would be really hard to get this out in front of people. Um, now, you've got a pretty great collection, but you also have friends with great collections. You I also do. went through our stash on it. And then as you guys started doing the book, did people come out of the woodworks and like recommend? Like, oh, hey, yeah. Yeah. Especially oh. at the uh, final hour, about a week before we went <laughs> to publishing, uh, Treasure Trove. Yeah, I mean, we, we had the opportunity, and we were very fortunate this, uh, on this to have the greatest art collector of D&D, a guy named Matthew mm -hmm. Coder, really gave us access to his full archive. And he has so many of the beautiful original paintings. His collection of easily paintings is easily the best in the world. Really? Um, so all of those kind of orange spine. Easily and easily, I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, all those orange spines. Easily uh, the best. Easily yeah. the best. Um, all the orange spine stuff, uh, we've got just beautiful renditions of those in here. And so, and when you see them um, in, in the book, and this, this is a, an actual exactly. kind of just off the press. Um, yeah, so I was going to say, I don't, I've never seen one of the actual actuals. Yep, this I've is, seen the, uh, you did a prototype you brought to some, but this feels like a first off the line. Uh, I believe this is a printing proof, so it's still yeah. just a little bit, I think it's still being tweaked, but, but this is, this is yeah. pretty close. At this, this point, is your actual, final actual. Sorry, I'm a little early here. Yeah, go go to oh, go to an easily page where you've got some of those. Let's see here, I'm a little too early. early, so let's find like that. Obviously, if you're down here at Comic Con more. or if you're at Gen Con, we're going to have these there. You can actually flip through them in person. So that nice is Gen Con. It'll be at Gen Con too. Okay. Yeah, nice. Like, there's a nice example, Monster Manual Two. No one's ever seen it like that. It didn't yeah. print that well in the original book at TSR. Yeah. I and mean, that's the thing, the process they had, I mean, they had great artists, but it's hard to get it onto those kind of textbook hardcover surfaces they were Yeah, using, they have right? a certain and printing texture. Also then, they take some liberties in post-production, and maybe they mute the image, and they congeal it to make it fit with the logo. So you're seeing it in its native form. You get to see like the brush strokes, the real colors that were intended by the artist, and oh, so many I classic mean, covers you're going to see in a whole new light because of the way they're presented in this book uh, in yeah, I mean, straight from the artist's desk. <laughs> okay. it, and it gives you a new appreciation for, for how good these artists were. I mean, again, when you really look at the natives of these things, they're just... Yeah. I mean, Legends of Lore, I mean, you, just, you don't get a sense of what that painting is about. Or, or this, the Oriental Adventures cover here. You don't get a sense of how good these are yeah. until you see them like this. Well, um, we've got a couple originals in the office, and uh, when you get up close and look at the original originals, it's it's way more fun. Like, yeah. you're just going, oh, yeah, because you're right, because the printing back then, it just didn't do it justice. The you used to logos and barcodes yeah. and age recommendations and all that kind of clouding the page, and this you can just see it for what it was. I mean, it's really our privilege to be able to come to Seattle to shoot one of my favorite paintings yeah, from right early D&D, &D, oh. the Holmes Basic cover yep, uh, that yep, Sutherland yep. did. Um, yep, we got, a, we got that one in the... Yep, you've got yeah. that one. And, uh, um, you can literally see the craftsmanship in it, how it's manufactured, where the strokes are in the brush, yeah. where they focus their, their detail, where they realize, I don't need to be as detailed here because they're probably going to cover it up with something. So it's all... All, for all its glory and all its flaws, it's all right there, which now, is... Now, is that the Displacer Beast or is that the uh, other yes, one? Yes, I'm glad you special, asked. Special I'm glad story. you asked, Nathan. Uh, so, um, you... you'd asked about where we found some of this stuff, and we went to a lot of different people, and inevitably what happens is when you talk to somebody, they reference you to somebody else, or I was just talking to, you get a lot of this yeah. as you go through this process. Um, one thing I like about this page, actually, is it shows a little bit of a combination of things that are really in this book. Pristine product. Um, rare, never before seen draft type of material, and then final uh, native art, right? Yeah. So, of course, we know what this is, right? Yeah, everyone's seen that. Um, this is great, the Great Sutherland piece, uh, one of the most important pieces in D&D history by a long shot at Wizards. Um, uh, you know, a shrink wrapped basic set, of course. And then this page right here, this is a page that we got from a particular collector that is a page from the Holmes draft. This is the draft that Holmes submitted to Gary Gygax. And Christopher Holmes, his son, did a little renderings and drawings on this draft that never made it into production. What's amazing about this one is that we cannot find an earlier rendition of a Displacer Beast. This is probably the first known rendition of a Displacer Beast. Oh, that's pretty hot. Drawn so there's a lot son. of things like yeah. that in this book that I yeah. think we're pretty darn excited about. I'll give you one more little example that's just been kind of... It's been kind of singing to me here. You know, so when it comes to product, we had kind of a rule. It was kind of like, okay, we want to feature art, we want to feature product, we want to feature ephemeral, we want to feature drafts and photographs. Yep. Well, so if we can't feature pristine product, what do we want to feature? How about important product? Gary Gy Gygax's copy of Chain Mail. Probably uh, better than a perfect version. It's Gary Gygax's personal play version. Yeah. It's things like that it's that I think legend, differentiate uh, some yeah. of the, the, uh, the way we yeah. show product in this book. 
Oh my goodness, I uh, I really can't wait to just flip through everything. Now, I of course get to see a lot of things early, but then I don't know what stuff makes it in the book or not, but I've looked over their shoulder on the laptop just like flipping through things, but everything I've seen that they have, there's no way it's in the book because the book would be four times as big. So you guys have had to make some cuts, so uh, I'm interested in seeing what's in there, what's not. Obviously, we've got an Art Mark Hat 2 ready because you've got enough content. There's, 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 <laughs> there's, content there are now. thousands of images that you know we discussed that we came close that had to be put by the side. All right, hold this one up because Ooh, this okay. is one of my other favorites because oh, um, yeah. we still actually have one of these in the office <laughs> just for <laughs> posterity's sake. Oh, the Shrinky Dink, we do yes. Have a, we do have a Shrinky Dink, and along with the Shrinky Dink, we also have a bunch of the... And you gave me one of the napkins, whatnot, but we had some of the napkins in the other birthday yeah. uh, so <coughs> for the Dungeons & Dragons birthday kit. But the Shrinky Dinks... Are my favorite because it's shrinky things, yeah. and uh, and B because you got War Duke there with the yeah that's pretty awesome. Well, you know, and actually, th I'm glad you pointed to this page only because again, every page here is a story, right? We tried every page to tell a story, a dynamic one. So this little panel right here is particularly interesting. So this is a panel. So this is from the Dragon uh, box art for the toy. Okay, okay? for the LJN. Uh, it's for yeah. the LJN toy. What's amazing about it though is that you know you can see it's War Duke, right? He's fighting the Dragon. Um, it's by Ken Kelly. Ken Kelly was a nephew of Frank Frazetta. And what makes him particularly uh, interesting is that he was the one that did the cover for Love Gun, Kiss's Love Gun. He was the, the cover artist for it. If you know all those Kiss fantasy yeah. renderings, it's by the same artist that was hired by LJN to do, LJN to do oh, these that pieces. That totally makes sense. Oh, so yeah. it, it's little things like that. Again, that's where I think we, we kind of took this, this entire visual history. We said, yeah. how do we tell the entire story of the brand and tell it through visuals? Yeah, so, that's the thing, right? It is a history book. It just happens to be with more you, visuals. And you can okay. experience it visually. If you're a person that just wants to sit down, open up a book, leisurely flip through it, you're going to get a sense of the history and the story, how the brand evolved and the oh, conversation going on. But if you also just want to start on page one and read a narrative story, you are going to get the on a macro level of how the brand in its nascent days, got its start out of a garage, and how it exploded into what it is now with 5th edition. And you're going to get that narrative, cultural history with, with art commentary as well. So it has something for everyone based on uh, how you want to experience it. Oh, look at those two. And you know, uh, I like to spoil things on, uh, on my streams lots of times, and uh, everyone tries to egg me on. And um, I told him we were going to announce some, a couple extra official settings on Monday. And so this is one of the crowd favorites. Everyone really hopes that it's going to be Dragonlance and Kren. Uh Yeah, I know. And I just won't tell them. I know. that They're probably already all over it now. Most people, by the way, think that it's Spelljammers or Eberron. Um, I like to throw out some other wild cards there. Oh, uh, holy Caldwell. I mean, again, yeah. it, when you see these things in their original form, they just knock your eyes out. No, again, by this they time, they really do though. It, you know, by this time, they were they were reproducing relatively well. I mean, you're talking about eighty four, eighty five, where this is the original calendar. But I mean, again, seeing the native piece of these photographed at high resolution, it just it just knocks your eyeballs out. Well, and now you can actually like the uprising you can do in the attention detail and stuff, right? You actually get some really, really, really close. Yeah. Whereas even five or ten years ago, you didn't. I mean, it was yeah. just like as soon as you put it in and laid it onto the stuff, you like were a, a layer down. And a lot of things in here too, a, you may have yeah. seen before, but there are a lot of rescans or new scans where they are much better resolution, much better representation of artist intended color. So. I think whenever there was a chance to scan something again, rather than default to what existed, we went that direction. So this became the, the preeminent archive version of it. And see, I've seen this one a hundred times too, but I've seen it on product, and the product's so old and worn. It has now such a different that, feeling. Yeah, to see it, it and, totally well, does. And inevitably, they're cropped, right? And you'll be yeah. able to see in the actual painting a little bit more detail on the edges, and sometimes yeah. it's interesting. And some of the most detail, iconic so. ones, these huge spreads, did you just see what's on the front cover? Yeah. And you lose a little bit because it wraps around, but then to see it in a cinematic kind of spread, it has a totally different effect on you. Well, and now when we do it too, even when we do it, you know, I mean, we kind of go edge to edge and try and get as much in there. Not, but because we, you have to put some of, like you said, the barcodes and stuff in the back. You know, we still cut off about, you know, I would say a fifth of the of the image. Uh, you know, the entire image is there, and then we cut off about a, a fifth on the edge. So, you know, we try not, to, the artists usually try not to put anything important there because yeah. they know what we're doing and they've seen our, our trade dress. But still, there's something about the full picture because the artists are, artists and when yeah. they create this it looks beautiful in this thing and then we, we reappropriate yeah. it as for the cover of a product right, exactly. and this is some of it's returning it back to 
you know, what it was when it was on their easel, and this was just them with a blank canvas kind of paint a fantasy thing before anyone did anything with it. So it's really like a connection to what was in their head coming out. Like this is a well, and look if you know they're example. not, if they're going to crop the bottom inch anyway, and you're doing the player's handbook cover, a cover that everybody's always wanted to see, you might notice at the very bottom there, there's some unfinished details uh, that presumably Trampy knew they were going to crop it out. Legs in. <laughs> um, but yeah. see, this is the type of thing that again, and this piece was a was a major find. That this was a this very was important a piece. Well, and also, I mean, okay. everybody's that's such an You've iconic piece, that. whatnot. But I. I forgot that I've even seen the bigger... Well, yeah, there's a big bubble on it, right, and uh, uh, the printed wraparound cover. Yeah. Of but this came into our um, our orbit about, what, a week or two before it was do or die day. Really? We had to extend well, the do or die day a I little mean, we, bit we, just we to accommodate. We put it this way. Yeah, we, we were going to keep swinging for the fences until the last minute until of this project. Knew was going we knew no, that's we, exactly we were going to get everything in there we could. And uh, There's even a famous early beholder by Bell in here that says, no, <laughs> do no. not use Ooh. this one. And um, We're not showing that. That one, <laughs> that one we're going to hold. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to show me later. Oh, we're going to show you later. Speaking of that, can you flip to one of the pages where you can show kind of the, you lots of times put like the evolution of monsters. Yeah, in. yeah. I noticed you I'll guys are you. doing some promotion around um, uh, Comic-Con right. with the uh, the Mind Flare. Yeah. The yeah. And actually, this is kind of a nice tie-in with uh, with Joe's yeah. new line here, isn't it? There's the <laughs> well, this one. Is the, this, this is the D&D oh, so this D &D is a bait yeah. one that we made with Oh, yeah. very cool. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we've got Tom Wong's 1977 Beholder from the Monster yeah. Manual. And of course, you see where it shows up prominently right here. Uh, as we kind of have an evolution right through the beholder, which I think mm -hmm. this is, um, I mean, again, I think all these panels are extremely powerful, but you, you see, it, it tells you so much about what they were thinking, what stayed the same, what didn't over time, um, yeah. the different, different levels of art, digital versus painted. I mean, it's, it's pretty This is incredible. what I call the uh, Big Trouble in Little China beholder. Totally. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Also, a Jeff Easley uh, rendition yeah, from the uh, Monstrous, Monstrous yeah. Compendium. Yeah. Yeah. And GD is a global game. Uh, that's what it evolved from, you know, taking off in North America, but becoming a phenomenon around the planet. And we get into international covers and alternate printings. I think that's what's exciting as well to realize that yeah, you have the American edition, but different cultures are also going to sell the product in Actually, different ways. And right. that's represented in here as well. Oh, yeah, the Demogorgon has seen quite a uh, bit of uh, changes. And then this one's also really funny because uh, a lot of people have seen Stranger Things, and that might be how they kind of got, you know, yeah. reacquainted with D&D, &D, and so they talked about the Demogorgon, but like, they never actually showed the D&D Demogorgon. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, they, so they showed the Grenadier after, yeah. so they would only have D&D license, the Demon Lord series. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. But, uh, yeah, but this, uh, and, and he's had some different um, descriptions uh, and uh, and a little bit more baboon-like in uh, some of the editions and stuff. So one of the things we tried to do with fifth edition uh, was uh, kind of figure out what was the most common, what was the most popular, and then sometimes if there were pretty um, all over the map, then we kind of just picked our favorite and went. And so the Demogorgon we thought needed to be a lot more threatening and menacing. Yeah. And then whenever we depict him, we kind of try to show one of the, the personalities being just vastly different than the other. So that when you look at their faces, you can tell they're not on the same page. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, and speaking of descriptions, John, you want to talk about what this little page is here? Well, sure. Yeah. So this is more stuff from my <laughs> private stash. Um, I collect a lot of internal TSR memos, drafts, things like that. And this is a piece of paper where Gary Gygax has written down what the demons are supposed to look like for the benefit of Dave Sutherland, who had to draw them, of course, for then the book was Eldritch Wizardry, but then uh, Minifix was making the original metal for each of these as well. And so you can see his description oh. of Demogorgon and all the rest, the remainder of the demons and kind of, yeah. yeah, the baboon heads and the tentacles and everything else. And he kind of like, you know, divvied them all up lizards. by different segments of their body. And being able to show things like this, I think, provides so much context to how the art came about. Because it really was this informal. He would just give Dave Sutherland a list like this. This is what these things are supposed to look like. Like, go nuts. Yeah, and so they go invent the Demogorgon. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And, wow. well, and you can see how closely Sutherland adhered to it. I mean, if you look at the Type 1 demon here, what, you've, what you're seeing here exactly adheres to what the guy yeah. has described. I mean, so, and you can take each of these and, and see the same thing as you flip through Eldritch Wizardry and then look at the, the minifigs that came from them. So, well, you know what we did yesterday? I should have uh, brought him out. So, uh, yesterday, Todd James did our coloring book and Which a bunch great. of shirts yeah, and everything. Nice. He was here. Uh, and then we had Satine, who is an artist in her yeah. own right. So, we did uh, what we call Dungeons and Doodles. So, they draw Aww. on the fly. And so, I was rolling some dice and had them draw a five legged, seven armed, three eyed monster. <laughs> what do you go? 
uh, Todd did a Zorn, like a extra, <laughs> some extra legs and eyes on the Zorn, but it was like AD&D Zorn. It was pretty hot. That's awesome. That's cool. Uh, and Satine, uh, she did one that's more like the demon, like the bird feathers, demon-like, but uh, kind of like crossed with a spider. I had like spider feet so we could like move fast on the ground and then that's also cool. like the arachnid eyes. It was fun. That's it was pretty cool to see them like draw in real time. Yeah. And I imagine these guys back in the day was a little of that, right? Like. Is this what you were thinking? You know? Well, but that's the thing, is that, you know, Greg Bell would get an instruction from Gary Gygax to draw some thing, right? You know, yeah. like, like a beholder, and he's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be it's, like. And it's like when you're making a film, it's like concept art for a director, and Gary's yeah. the director, and he has all these ideas in his head, and he would say, put some of them down, I want to see this dragon with this many heads, and yeah. it's abstract until an artist starts putting down a piece of paper, and, and it's very like, no, that's not what I was thinking. And yes. you're going to see some of those failed experiments in here, too. Oh, really? I don't we've think got, anyone's ever that type of thing. seen, um, so there's yeah. some surprises. And, and that's, of course, uh, we've showed you a lot of early stuff, not to ignore kind of the, the huge cache of stuff we have uh, later, thanks, of course, with Wizards of the Coast, Wizards among others. Yeah. Uh, I mean, showing just how, uh, again, uh, we, we all probably know the third edition books, at least a lot of us yeah. do. Um, uh, what an interesting thought, though, that we went to this in-world design. It's worth exploration, it's worth looking at it and saying, wow, they went from this very traditional, kind of 80s style fantasy art, right into something like this, how provocative, how interesting. Yeah. Um, so this is the kind of exploration we do. Again, it, we really are trying to tell the full story, and a lot of times what the art is doing is really match matching what the brand is doing, what the company is doing. Yeah. Um, so that's what, that's what makes it fun. And these are great, and we actually were really close on 5th edition to actually leaning a bit more into that. That was one of the kind of dilemmas that we were having. Hmm. Uh, and we went the way we did because um, I think one of the biggest challenges of the brand right now, and your book is definitely uh, going to help a ton with this, is just having um, strong visuals of named heroes and monsters that people can identify with a, a singular look. Mm -hmm. um, and so realizing that that was one of the biggest things we did when we were real world building is like, well, we have this opportunity, this big marketing opportunity to go full page, full color, right? We put named people in the front. I don't let them put them on the front of a book unless there's a story. They gotta have a name and a story. Um, and it's so, we can do that, but if we would have gone another way, it would have been more of the in-world. And we get into video games, we get into toys, we get into comic books, novelizations, we dig deep into so like commercials iconography. like commercials created from ads, right? Like logos and advertising. It, advertising, advertising is a huge subplot about how the brand would sell itself. And yeah, miniatures, it's all in there. So it's not just about cover art or module art. This is expansive. So it's all aspects of the brand. And it's also private photos. You're getting pictures, um, just internal company stuff, little yeah. in, in jokes. There's, you really get a sense of the people who made it, the, the artists. Roper. The Roper. I, now you guys have visited the mentioned. office, so you guys have all met Stanley. We've met yes. Stanley. <laughs> I want to know, is there a, a furley coming? Uh, ooh. We need a furly. I really, I, if I was to invent the D and D creature, I would invent the furly. Okay. Someone doesn't get along with the roper. Okay, I can see that yeah. one. Goes three's company. Uh, oh, that's some good stuff. And the well, art, you guys have just captured the art. So and also an interesting well. feature too is the artist favorite. So we talked to a lot well, of you the, to Wayne and found a lot of the key artists, some of the most important artists, and asked them. I got some surprising board, answers about what was the piece of art that you think is your most important, or what is your most personal favorite. And they give you a little anecdote about why that one. And there were some really surprising choices by some of the most I iconic artists in D&D history. It's really what you'd ever expect, right? We would all expect, you know, oh, it's obviously going to be this, this really famous piece they did for so-and-so. And, -so. and it, it's rarely ever that. that you know, it interesting. honestly doesn't surprise me now because I've talked to enough of the uh, original authors uh, and hearing kind of sometimes they're not to talk bad about the past words, but I think they were cranking stuff out so much sometimes that I, I think the artists and the authors especially lots of times were, they didn't love a piece they did because they might remember like, oh, there was a rush, and they didn't get to take the time I wanted to do the thing, so there's probably lots of stories. Oh, and this was a thing John Chinetti did with a bunch of different artists. Exactly. Of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just Dragon like, Magazine oh. is also a subject for us, the Absolutely. animated series. So. If you're a fan also of a specific realm, we dig deep into uh, different worlds. Was that an old King Schnur? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. So this is this is fourth edition trying to Kyle, you're good at speaking to the amazing kind of MMO concept. Well I think what was happening that. in you have to look at what was happening in the world of gaming. There's a lot of uh, video games are and, and yeah. home computing and that was taking off, and people were playing it and connecting with it, and maybe in part of in the subconscious of Dungeons and Dragons, they're competing with that, and they started to use higher, more dynamic angles, wider angles, almost like what the musical is doing in Hollywood. They're showing off more, jamming more into the frame, showing the action of it. Whereas I look at Fifth Edition, I find it to be 
quieter cinematic moments sometimes. Like, I love like that one from Storm King Thunder, Thunder where he's got where he's got the huge blade and the head has been cleaved off the, the oh, giant. Oh, you like that one. And that's it's that's very really different. Whereas if that was in fourth he edition, you'd be seeing the person cleave the head right, off yes, the giant. Yeah. And almost that, that's like a contemplative hero moment. So they have these different energies about them, the editions. I think that's important to look at what what D D was trying to communicate, what they were competing with, what was in the yep. marketplace. And fifth edition looks like, you know what? We are an analog game in a lot of ways. It might be played digitally, we might be harnessing Twitch and things like that, but we're gonna just be what we are rather than worrying about what other people are doing. Yeah, we definitely try to really find our voice. And I think in the end of third edition, beginning of fourth, I think they were, uh, rather than going for like a, a brand or look or feel, I think they were going for an energy thing that they were level that they were yeah. trying to get. And I think you're right. I think they were trying to uh, compete with maybe the freneticness of video yeah. games. But in a static way. And it was in the style yeah. of the game, too, in the mechanics of the game. And that's that's another thing, is how, how do the mechanics of the game require a certain type of art to be what's put forward to represent the brand? And we talk about a lot of the early, earliest art. It's not meant to be dynamic, gorgeous art. It's meant to be functional and tell you yeah. how a game mechanic works. Right. Or, yeah. or what a monster looks like. Yeah, yeah. right. Who's supposed to know what a crazy right. monster What's a right? mind flayer look like? Yeah. Or yeah. What's a beholder look like? And, what does Chevy Chase look like? Well, and, well and, and one part we haven't talked about yet is, is of course, how the consumer interacts with this art and what part they play. So, John, you want to talk about what kind of we're looking at here? Like, this is an yeah. really interesting. Well, I mean, so the visual history of D and D, I think, encompasses as well what we all make, right? Because what was it? Chris Perkins says that you guys, you, you don't make the drink, you make the cup. Right. right, But the drink is also a part of the visual history of the game. The things like player-generated maps, like you see on the left of this. Mm -hmm. And I, this actually came from a campaign that's run at uh, Kickstarter by Luke Crane. You probably know Luke Crane. Yeah. Um, where he plays B2 with the people oh, there. And so this is actually a map of the Caves of Chaos that his players generated and it shows kind of their history, some of their encounters and things like that. And we really wanted to try to draw that into the visual history as well, to not just make it be about you know, what, what the, the official product you know, looks like, but as well kind of how we all interact with it and what creativity we bring to it. Where has it been represented on the 70s show? Stranger Things, oh. E.T. Oh, fifth edition. Futurama. Now yeah, now we're home. This was Tyler's favorite, really. That was Tyler, right. Yeah, Tyler had a couple, I think he mentioned a couple that was his favorite. He basically said, you know, the two covers I did for the, the core books are yeah. just, you know, th those, are, those are the ones that I would put at the top of my list. So, right there, you got the DMG. My favorite Tyler book is the Volo's Guide to... Volo's uh, is nice, yeah. Volo's yeah. is great. That's my favorite Tyler. It's yeah. just so... There's yeah. a, I mean, there's just a very beautiful, obviously, William O'Connor, of course, passed away yeah. recently. Um, just a really beautiful, kind of really thoughtful piece. Again, I, I think this is one of the more calming uh, particular images of 5th edition that I, I love in particular. Gives you a good sense of space, descent, what, the, what involves a quest. It's not just about action. Oh, the so this, this is our favorite, Kurt Gould. Yeah. So um, up, this is up actually in one of the conference rooms, right? Yeah. That's it was Dragon's the closest, Nest. Yes, this, the Dragon's, Dragon's Nest, yes. this uh, <laughs> huge, huge painting is. And so... Because Kurt was the guy who actually found the Holmes Basic painting, I guess in a warehouse when he heard some people were moving something. Yeah, basically they kind of just like went laying under a pile of Ran stuff. over to see what it was. And I've known Kurt for, for many years. He's a guy who's been with, jeez, he's been with Litters how long? I don't know. Oh, since, yeah. Since he was a kid. Since he was a kid, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since he was born. Yeah, yeah. that's what I heard. He was born into indentured servitude. He was to the coast. Well, he Be had careful. to pay for his habit of buying that's DB right. stuff. That's right, that's right. So we got a picture of him in front of this very modern dragon holding that original painting yeah. from 1977. Yeah, every page has a story to it. Every page has a narrative. And then those things tie into the bigger, bigger picture. And I forgot what town they're <laughs> flying over there, but that is the first town that you go to in uh, Tyranny of Dragons. Um, oh, oh, Tyranny is... is um, I, I did not know that. Yeah. And because, again, because we want a story yeah. in all the pictures that we do. And so mm -hmm. it's like... No, no, who's the dragon, what town, you know, why, uh, and this one. And then the funny thing about this image that he's standing in front of uh, is that I've got a picture that I posted of Tyler signing the corner down oh, the bottom. Right so if you look close on the wall, you'll see Tyler's signature down in the corner. Uh, that was a fun it's one. It's an incredible piece. It's uh, an incredible piece. You know, we had him do that just randomly. That one was just a, hey, we know we need some art, but we didn't know what. We said, well, we really haven't done enough dragons yet, so we should get him to do like a really epic. So Shauna kind of gave him, or Richard, I'm not sure if commissioned that one, kind of gave him like pretty free reign and just said, we just need like a really cool dragon, like have fun. And that one's epic. That's incredible. Uh, you had mentioned, you know. Yeah, Deadly's the Dungeon. Ball, so. The Doom Ball. Uh, I love this version of the Doom Ball. Yeah, I guess that's is... probably from Tales, that one is. Or, I don't think that's the Dead and Tales one, is it? Oh, wait, maybe it is. No, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. 
I think that's one from Tails. But um, yeah, I mean, we wanted to make sure that we saw the continuity of that. And there, you know, there are so many references um, that you see every once in a while in the history of the brand. Or we want to get back to that style of the, the deadly death trap hmm. dungeon. Yeah. Um, oh, James and I's favorite now. Yeah, uh, so my, my son has this affinity for beholders, but today he discovered uh, on the back of this book. Oh, I, I know where you're going with this. The wonderful there Mimic by Hydro 74. Can I tell you guys my joke? Because it, it only plays in this crowd. Let's Got do it. it. <laughs> okay, so uh, a group of adventurers uh, walk into the bar, and uh, this guy pointed the bar and pointed the sign and said, No weapons. And he goes, What do you need your swords for? And they said, Mimics. And so the bartender laughed, and the adventurer laughed, and the table laughed. So he killed the table. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. My, my daughter didn't get that one as well, but I think it plays well. That's pretty good. Oh, and you even went with the oh. clip. That, that, that oh. didn't even get done Here, until just, you guys were going to print. We'll just actually give you the full story here if you think about where this book starts and, and, yeah. where, and not where it ends, but, but pretty close to it, of course. Yes. This very famous, very wonderful D&D &D ad That's from right. Who needs to hang around? Is that right? It looks like a don't do drugs, do D and D. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's you could be now, cool and play at the same time. But the funny thing about this, right? Like with whole milk. So you look at the picture. I mean, minus him in the uh, in the overalls, because I don't know where that was. Uh, gosh, but when you gosh, get this, who gosh. needs to hang around? I've got Dungeons and Dragons. But then you see this picture, and this is how we played my house. I mean, they weren't in the basement. I mean, I grew up in California. We didn't have basements, but uh, <laughs> but we played at the yeah. kitchen table. I mean, my mm -hmm. cousin who was ten years older than me, and my aunt, his mom, like. We played as a family, like it was a family game. I, so probably the most iconic depiction of D and D on screen is in Steven Spielberg's E. Oh, T. E. Yeah. And they're playing at the in the at the kitchen yeah, right table with the whole table family. With the pizzas in and the whole family. The yeah. yeah, and the mom it's comes in at the table and like yep. tells it and whatnot. Yeah. So that's what I remember too. So I'm always like when everyone always says like the oh, you know, playing down I'm like, No, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure we were playing out in the open. Like we weren't <laughs> hiding. Yeah. Uh, so that's a weird one. But yeah, so then you got And then of course one. we've got like and that is actually, Mercer is now the kid. Yeah. And he's grown up. And, and, and it's such a, I love this shot. Sam in there. Sam always makes me laugh, but <laughs> that particular one. Oh, and then Ashley, I think she like even had braces on in that shot. That's, uh, yeah. that's beautiful. You know, and one thing that's worth mentioning about, about showing something like this, of course, this is, of course, a critical role piece right here. And um, what's neat here, again, you know, so obviously being officially uh, partnered with, with Wizards on this was incredible. In fact, book would have been impossible without it, right? I mean, of the 700 plus images in this book, right? 620 of them are, are wizards' images. But there's um, what I, what I want to kind of mention is that there's another probably 80 plus yeah. images in this book that are licensed, or we had to some other find some other way to convince somebody to let us use them. Uh, why? Because it was important to the story. That is to yeah. say, when you need to show the New York Times article that shows where the the James Dallas Egbert event happened, or yeah. you need to show. Uh, the CBS movie that was talking about this, or even the animated series, which of course were partnerships with, of course, TSR and Marvel others. And um, else, yeah. So there was a lot of work to be done in that respect, and I'm very happy to say I think we, we found everything we were looking for. We, we got to use everything we were looking for. And most people were pretty cool about it, right? Because what I find in this is when you talk to D and D, whatever, however they've touched in the past, they're like, yeah, no, let's do it, right? Like everyone's pretty, you know, it's kind like of just the, like your the table. pinball machine, the Bally's pinball is maybe one of Bally's the harder pinball. things, right, to navigate. Uh, people mm -hmm. don't realize what their thing is worth or not worth. And, well, I, I mean, know. that's the amazing, right? You come to these organizations who haven't seen it. They haven't even seen this ad. They don't even know it exists. Like, we and they haven't used it in 35 yeah. years. And, right, right. and you say, well, I want to license this. And you're like, oh, okay, well, it's going to cost $1 million, right? Yeah. <laughs> And, and you're like, okay, I'll give you like a hundred dollars, you know, and, and you know, and you negotiate, and it's yeah. exactly. But I mean, you you start to realize that that it's a really uncertain economy, even as you do this. There's no precedent for what yeah. any of these things are, are really worth. Yeah, they don't realize that it's value until you come out. And you them, see right? a lot of the old Marvel comics that inspired uh -huh. the early art, and we you know get those specific panels and covers, so you you can see the inspiration for art too. Did you make it the other night before DJ Z trip stopped spinning? I was here. Yeah. yeah. Because you came in late. It was he was doing Slayer with the animated series. Oh, yeah, but he yeah. was pulling stuff from this yes, record, yes, yes, too. Yes, yes. He was playing the stuff stuff. from this kid's record and uh, and mixing it, yeah, with, like, Megadeth. And so, like, it was yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that made me think of, like, I know he pulled from this record. I forgot about the Viewmaster. The Viewmaster. Um, the candy, the Viewmaster, the coloring books through uh, Marvel. But this is the thing. Like, the, the kids who started playing from 5th edition, and, and bless them, um, yes. you know, they, they may not have seen this, right? And we want them to be able to see the book and to see the history of the brand going back through all these fascinating periods in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And also, people who started in the 70s and 80s, they might not know that much about Critical Role. Yeah. They might not know that much about, and so we want to kind of hit 
both sides of that, yeah. right? And just show everybody who's been into this, if you're into it now, if you were into it then, we think there's something for you in yeah. this. Well, I think that's smart, but I also, you know, from my standpoint, just kind of, you know, being in the brand, like we have these really two big pockets of gamers uh, in D&D. We have a big giant group of our demographic, but now our next biggest demographic is like 25 year olds that are getting into fifth edition for the first time. It's the first edition they've ever played. You want to know how they learn about D&D? watching someone play online. Exactly. Yeah, they didn't exactly. say Critical Role, but I'm sure that a lot of them, that was it, right? Yeah. And, and I would say that, you know, knowing that Forgotten Realms, of course, is our backdrop, you know, today, I, I think that group is going to be very interested to see Ed Greenwood's original Sword Coast right here. A map that I, I understand that Wizards used to own it and gave it back markers. to Ed, which I think was a very classy thing to do, by the way. This was in a drawer, I know, for a long That's time so at Wizards. Cool. That's so cool. Ed, uh has done so much uh, for the brand, but the Forgotten Realms, whenever we come to a question where we're doing stuff with it, like, Ed, what were you thinking when the, and <laughs> yeah, it's so nice yeah. to actually have someone who's just got the lore on us. I mean, well, we have a lot of people in the building, but when they're stumped, we just call it Greenland. And That's I mean, great. I wish that we could have gotten the pictures we took from Stream of Many Eyes into this, because we have Ed in full Elminster cosplay, like, standing, Elminster. standing next to that, yeah, we that had painting, printed. right? Pointing at the, you know, oh, segments yeah. Number of the up here. Oh yeah, we would love to use that. You'll see it on our social media feeds surrounding oh, all this, yes. so yeah. This is great. Uh, first of all, is everyone in the stream enjoying, can you guys see the pictures? Do you like where we're going? Usually we take a lot more questions. Uh, although I did notice one person in here yeah. is gonna buy a coffee table so that they would have a place to put the book. Uh, <laughs> yes. So the book's already pre-ordered, but they're thinking now they might need a coffee table. Just be or, sure it's a sturdy one, because yeah. look at this thing. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a brick. Right. Or you could buy the special edition the Barnes & Noble edition the and the regular thing? edition and just stack them, <laughs> and, stack them on top. and then put your drink on that. Yeah, it would serve oh, wait, as a from the table. old uh, Eye of the Beholder. Uh, uh, it's got uh, Pool of Radiance. Oh, yes, we, we have a little, radiance, bit of, sorry, uh, yeah. little bit of Pool of Radiance. I mean, yeah. again, we really wanted to cover, um, we, we just thought really holistically about what did the game look like. And sometimes the game looked like how most people experienced it. In this case, the gold box was was how more people were experiencing the game at that particular time mm. than, than what was happening on the tabletop. So for those people who don't know, I'm gonna explain a couple things on here. This is called a floppy disk. <laughs> yes. That's a five and a quarter floppy disk. That was a, the, all we called it was floppy disk until they came out with the non-floppy floppy disk, which totally threw me. Uh, and this one you can't see very well, but I'm gonna tell you what this guy is. is. This is an anti-piracy wheel. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, the game would load up and get you to get a, a sequence that you turn these two dials to, and then it will have the answer to what that is. And it's supposed to be for anti-piracy and bootlegging. Mm -hmm. However, this thing has just like a brad in the center holding it together, so people would take it off, photocopy each layer of the thing, and just recreate the rings when they photocopy, when they make copies of the disc. Mm -hmm. Also, and now you guys really don't care, but these were also um, piracy protected. Uh, they weren't uh, read-write. Uh, they were just read, uh, unless you took a hole punch and punched the oh, sides. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. It's just, I mean, it, it's, again, I mean, it, it's a pretty incredible story, it, big picture. I mean, of course, had to get some screenshots of the different versions and of the And the funny thing is, is um, that both of these were such Great images back then when we like they were like we're cutting edge back then. Yeah, it looked like well, real life, right? Oh, <laughs> and, and it had like this this stutter frame animation. Yeah. They go, so if you saw the goblin, he was like, eh, 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 eh. Um, that was like, hilarious. Yeah, like the kobold would jab. I think yeah. he was. Yeah, I remember he was. Well, yeah. but, I, I went back and played um, Skate or Die. Uh, oh, yeah. Skater, and I went back and I'm like, oh. Lester, I thought, had like a face with like a like a nose and a, like you could really like he was like five pixels in the game. But in my <laughs> memory, oh, that's it was the, the whole the thing. But here's the thing: that's always been true, right? And yeah. kids, you know, games will be so much more sophisticated in oh, yeah. you know VR in your oh, eyes, yeah. whatever. Show everyone that one. Okay, this is a fan favorite. Here, this is our. our Kyle, I'm going to dedicate this our resident, to Kyle here. Our resident expert. Uh, <laughs> a lot of times, I wrote the unfavorable subjects. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, some of the subsections that I, I think, I, I, I was like, I'll explore some Spelljammer. Let me get into the animated series. Um, yeah, Spelljammer, I have, I have an affinity for it. I feel like it's, it's different. It's cool. It's obviously, they was inspired by what was successful yeah. at the time, which was Star Wars and Space Fantasy. And then there were other uh, games trying to capitalize on RPG and making space stuff. So D&D &D, D &D wanted to have their own. It um, seems like sci it seems like space fantasy is coming back though. It seems sure. like it's kind of back in the ethos a little bit now. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. This is a beautiful Brom panel right here. Yeah. I'd like people to realize that Brom, when he first came in... Oh, look at this little um, undead up there. Yeah, oh, the, the, this, is a, this is a skeleton. Brom yeah. get started in D&D? &D? Like, wasn't... Uh, the, that's what made him famous? Well, so it, it's what made him famous, for sure. Um, but, but what happened when he came in was that Spelljammer was... As he tells, it was a little, a little bit of a hot potato. Nobody, a lot of people didn't want to work on Spelljammer for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was kind of anointed. It was one of his first jobs to do was he got to do Spelljammer. Uh, of course, he easily did a, a bunch of art for Spelljammer as well. But, um, yeah. but again, everyone knows him, of course, for Dark Sun. But, you know, he got started on things like this. And he, he drew, he did beautiful things for it. And we actually, we went to Brahms' house when we were doing research for this and hung out with him a bit in his that studio. Was cool. and, uh, that was cool. And interviewed him there. His studio looked like you would expect. It did. Brahms studio like, to like, which is cool. Skulls, cabinets Gothic, of curiosities. Yeah. It was very black. Um, another Gothic. classic, awesome. yes, of course. And do we want to talk about... I think, we do. Ooh, gonna have I think to. we do. We're going to have to. I think we do. I got to be box? honest. I want to just, like, for the next couple of hours, flip through this, and then a couple more hours, flip through that. <laughs> okay, so first of all, um, give me the rundown again for the uh, Christmas. So you guys have three different versions that they can buy, and you don't have to just buy one. You can buy all three. You, you are perfectly welcome to buy so two each the, of all three. There's the general, which is this. This is this. Yeah. So this is wide scale, general. Uh, not while supplies last, we're gonna make as many reprints as humanly possible. Uh, this is gonna be the, your standard uh, okay. yeah, go-to here. Okay, yeah. and then this one over here is what we call the, which one is this? It's this the is the edition. special edition. It's uh, initial price point is $125, but like I said, you can find it cheaper on Amazon. Um, and it's got Hydro 74 uh, art on the cover and, and back. And we've got, we've got, um, yeah, let's, let's got the book inside, and you can see it's a totally different cover, again, and back. And uh, interior is going to be exactly the same in this version. Uh, but the Barnes & Noble edition looks like that, and it has red. Instead of, instead of yeah, black. Instead of black, it has red. Oh, I like the red box. And what it has is a, a feature that you, you uh, fold out, several of them. Oh, it does. With art that we couldn't fit into either of these two. So the Barnes so, & Noble one is actually, well this has got extras though too, it's just not in the book. Yes. Yeah, we'll talk about those extras in a minute. Okay. Yeah, so the, if you do the Barnes & Noble edition, which is probably similarly to this. Yeah, it's, it's, usually, uh, it's the same usually price point. a few bucks higher, but it, it has a little bit of, um, a little bit more dungeon content, you might say. Yeah. Yeah. Just a touch more that is, is meaningful, I think pretty cool, I might even say some alternate content. But, you know, the real interest in this comes from this mm. little envelope here that is attached to it, and the contents within this. So while you're open that, just out of curiosity, do you guys know Josh? Have you met Hydro before? Hydro 7? No, no. I've met him. Uh, so uh, he's fantastic, uh, and we love, love, love working with him. He's got a great story, and he's a really, like, he's all over the place. And he, he kind of pushes us a little bit on uh, cool ideas and cool things, because he's just, you know, uh, that's where his, his pen goes. And, uh, but I uh, knew him from before, because uh, when I was at uh, Madden, he was doing a lot of stuff with EA Sports and with oh, Nike. Nice. Because uh, he also does like uh, motocross stuff and video game oh. stuff and EA Sports. Uh, but then when we were looking for a cool cover to do for Nalt Cover, uh, Emmy Tanji, who's one of our uh, um, very, very talented uh, artists, uh, she pulled up a piece of his thing. And when I saw it, it was like one of his wolves or his owls or something I'm like, oh yeah, I love that guy. We should totally. And his style is just so cool. And he's it's now stri just it's striking. So it's totally different. Yeah. I mean, just so. And so you'll find in. Um, the prints attached. Some things we couldn't fit in. This is a good example. This is uh, from the World of Greyhawk, the 1983 box set, um, or the Easley. Oh, and these are and not so, final. Yeah, these are not the final. Yeah, these are, these are, are mock-up. Mock <laughs> but which, which ones do you want to do here? Kind of the, whole, I know the fans probably are like, all of them, all of them. Yeah. You know, a couple things you're going to want. This is one uh, I had the opportunity to shoot myself, actually. Uh, Ian Livingstone of Games Workshop, he, uh. he owns this. And I was able to visit him in London and to uh, uh, get that real up close with this, with the camera, which was... Uh, he, he licked it, too. In honor. I did, I licked it. it. And yeah. I had to repaint that part, actually, because it wasn't looking. <laughs> but it was, I don't know uh, if I would lick a guitar. <laughs> yes, that's just me. That's just me. For a while. What are those? Uh, maybe, the, maybe the DM screen? Sure. I mean, that's, a, that's pretty cute. Yeah, this is a piece oh, that yeah. uh, I thought one. was really crucial to have. If you oh, haven't yeah. seen the Trampier DM screen um, at, at this size, at this resolution, it's one of the most cinematic 
images in the early history yeah. of D and mean, he really puts things together in a way comparable to like a, a movie poster. Oh, yeah. like I mean, like he's, it's a movie poster. But it, it references things of his that we know. We can see the cover of the player's handbook kind of embedded down here, and just just such a fantastic panel play of activity. Yeah, and the final prints so. of these are going to be much yeah, more. Yeah, they look. These are very. These are these are very But yeah, I mean, that was interesting though, even to look at the history in it, because if you look at the dragon in that, that's unlike. Any red dragons? That's actually way more reminiscent of a gold dragon, but yeah, that's it's right. very red in color, um, and not like the other red dragons, even of that time period. It almost so. has more of like an Eastern art feel to yeah. it, as opposed to you know Western art. It's different yeah. dragons. Well, yeah, and our different dragons kind of all have their own different you know kind of shapes and yeah. backstories and stuff. And so yeah, the gold one is definitely more Eastern influenced, mm -hmm. and um, that's cool. But should we talk about the other thing? Uh, yeah. oh, we we're gonna have to talk about the other thing a little bit. I guess we're talking about the other thing. The other thing the we other need thing to talk about about that. Oh. He had mentioned earlier about oh. uh, Tomb of Horrors in 1975 okay. Origins. That doesn't look like the Tomb of Horrors cover I've seen. So That's it's true. not. So there was a monster that came out in 1978 that was called the Tomb of Horrors that yeah. was an adaptation of this original brutal, legendarily just death trap uh, tournament that Gary Gygax personally ran at Origins in 1975. And we were able uh, to get a facsimile of the pages that were just handed out to the Dungeon Masters. The only people who would have gotten this at the this time has never been were the, printed. the four people who ran this game then. Now there were a few photocopy bootlegs that kind of spread out from that that, later one you that went know. out to, yeah. you know, out into the community. And because of that, we were able to get this, well, it's a, it's a little brown book, isn't it? I mean, we've done it very much in the style of what yeah. we have found. You can in play the it. So if you get the special or, edition one, that's in the... This is, this is what you get. And this contains all of the original panels of the art that were in the Tomb of Horrors. Let's so if I run this Tomb of Horrors for someone, are they going to live? The panel. <laughs> you know, I cannot guarantee that your party will survive this. We'll just show this. And actually, I can show this. Why don't we show this little piece? Of okay, no deal. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a green double face, it's kind of famous, that appears in this. So there's a young artist by the name of Tracy Lesh, who they got to do this material. Why don't you say a bit about Tracy Lesh's background? Yeah, no, the, I mean, what, a, what an amazing background. I mean, again, such a, a humble, what, what, what an amazing story and such a humbling way to begin. Um, this notion that there were these young kids in town that were, you know, kind of gamers and whatever. Um, we talked a lot about Greg Bell and, and his early influence and his early work. He was maybe 16, 17 years old. But Tracy Lesh um, was in Elise's, like, uh, Elise's Gary's daughter. He was in her social studies class or something like that. And as the story goes, anyway, she saw him doodling one day and said, you know, my dad would be interested. My dad would dig that. <laughs> so whatever, whatever ended up happening, um, Gary ended up hiring Tracy Lesh to do Boot Hill, which was, of course, an of early course, TSR yeah, role-playing yeah, yeah. game. And um, we know, we could even track down per some letters that John has that Tracy Lesh was asked, uh, conscripted probably, to do these panels within maybe a two or three week period, right before Origins once started in Baltimore in 1975. And right before his finals, I mean, seriously. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man, what am I going to do? Um, and, but what's incredible about it, so you've got 2,000 panels from Tracy Lesh in here that are all, um, at least in terms of their composition, the same things you would recognize from the later Trampier Sutherland panels. But these are the original Tracy Lesh panels. Yeah. And these were, they needed these at the tournament because you only had two hours, right, to explore the Tomb of Horrors. And yeah. It was that they had a pre-generated 15-character party. And so you need to think about the reason why there are all these just arbitrary death traps is because they're trying to just winnow that down, right, uh, to the hardy survivors. And, but because they had so little time, rather than explaining to you what you're seeing, they wanted to be able to show you a picture when you came in. This is, this is what you're looking at. This is what happens to you right yeah. now. And it's hard. You know, this was so early. This is only 18 months after the game had come out, right, that they were doing this. There hadn't been anyone who had shown dungeon scenes that way. And that's why, you know, we call this Art in Arcana. We want it to be a visual history. Yes, this is a module. You can play this module. But also because of those panels of art, you know, we think this is one of the most important, you know, art documents in the history of the game because it brought you into the game world in a way that previous art really hadn't. That's so cool. You guys have found just so, so, so many cool things. And if you think that's geeky, John, you want to talk about a little appendix we have in here? Okay, so... Oh have yes, you heard there's this a little bit more. Do you know where he's going with this? La the last little bit of this. So yeah, we, we wanted a little icing on the cake of this. Um, if you look at the cover of the 1978 Tomb of Horrors, uh, Gary makes reference there to the fact that there was a guy named Alan Lucian who had uh, done an original tomb and that his tomb was kind of based on that. Now, Alan was a guy who was a very early adopter. He was based in California. He actually sent Gary some ideas that ended up going into uh, the Greyhawk pamphlet, the first supplement to yeah. D&D that was released in the spring of 1975. And, you know, it turns out, actually, that Alan's original tomb survives. Now, it's not long. There's a map, there's a few pages of keying, 
and some very interesting things in it that ended up being later system elements, and we have managed to get that into this as well. Just a brief and appendix, so, maybe four or five pages at the end, but. And so you'll be able to see not just the Tomb of Horrors, but even the precursors, because that's what you, you do when you're us, right? <laughs> We're not satisfied just to show you. Yeah, we know you know the 1978 Tomb of Horrors. Yes, the 1975, you expect that of us, but then we go and find the original Alan Lucy. That well. was pretty exciting. That was pretty that cool. That was pretty good, yeah. That's awesome. Um, so let's do this. Uh, let's have the, the folks in the, um, in the chat room. Uh, why don't you guys, uh, and Lauren, you'll help them uh, get in order to put questions before the thing. So uh, I'm not going to take them right now, but I want you to line up a couple of questions in here, and I'll look through there um, so that you guys can tell it's a little bit more on here, but so that they can ask you some questions because right. presumably they want to know, you know, crazy stories about what you found and where, uh, you know, probably stuff you didn't put in the book. Uh, that was probably the hardest part of this thing anyway, right? It was whittling down. Yeah. Uh, you're yeah. just like, okay, we've got 955,000 pages. Let's get it down. Oh. The yeah. editing is as important as the writing. Yeah. The layout is, is just as important as the writing yeah. phase of it and how images next to each other have a conversation, contrast, compare. Now, were you guys tempted? I mean, you've got a little bigger format than we go. Were you guys tempted to go even bigger? I mean, did they make bigger books that are like... You I know, think like, the goal was so get to the still really make big. something that was at a healthy price point where, yeah. where everyone could, could access it, yeah. trying to... Compare it exactly to what you guys price your books at, and you yeah. know that you know that's sustainable thing. So it's like, what's the right shape and format? So you kind of did a little to, bit of the triangulating. Well, yeah. and and incidentally, one thing that we we did to our poor publisher, Ten Speed, we love you, Ten Speed. <laughs> um, one thing we did, I mean, we we ended up giving them twice as much content as they as they asked. Yeah, I mean, literally twice as much. Like you, like our contract says, give us this, and we gave them. Oh, you want three hundred fifty images? How about seven hundred? Yeah. And and but by the way, of, but well, can we have three hundred more? No. Um, I mean. <laughs> It, it, we, we really pushed the envelope because we wanted it to be comprehensive. And, you know, covering 45 years of history is, yeah. was and ambitious. It's in good shape, too, um, because Dragon Magazine, Dungeon Magazine, module covers, they're all about this shape, too. So it's not like everything's meant to be seen in a different yeah. way. So when we do things like that, they get special spreads. And, and, and you know, out. one thing I do want to mention, because I, I think it is really important to the conversation, one of the first conversations we had is, my gosh, how do we curate? Yeah. How do we curate the entire archive of D&D history? Yeah. I mean... What, what is it, 10,000 images? Is there 20? Is there 100? It's a lot, right? A lot. So at the end of the day, um, one thing we, we, we kind of sat down and figured out was, well, um, one thing we can kind of agree on, one thing we can do is actually check sales, sales, sales figures. We can check what oh, was yeah. actually most popular and what was most prevalent. So one thing that you could at least do is say, well... Can you share the sales figures with us? Absolutely. <laughs> John, get on. <laughs> um, Kurt and I have talked about this, yes. No, so at the end of the day, what you could say is that while we all have our favorites, that's not productive to get four people in a room yeah. and say, well, who likes this? Oh, I love that. Yeah. It, what it really comes down to is what did people see most? What, did, what, did, what resonated with people? Yeah. And of course, I mean, again, the, the aesthetic merit is important, but you really wanted to do, you know, we all love the Redbox cover. We yeah. also happen to know it was one of the best selling products of all time from the yeah. from the D&D standpoint. So, um, there was that's a lot not of those. Be true anymore, Sam, well, I know, I, I know that's true. Um, so, but, but this has recurred so many times, right? This yeah. was the starter set in 2010. Yeah. Uh, like this image came back for, for that. It yeah. was on wallets. It, it was, was on machines. Yeah, pinball what machines. Art, what it's art a, changed things? What art challenged things in the day? Yeah. Not just what was the the most famous or most popular. Well, that so is what one were the of the ones that caused the brand to evolve and transition. One of the questions from the thing uh, Kershaw said. What's the coolest thing you found in your searches that didn't make the book? So I imagine Ooh. you guys had to sometimes make that like, hey, this was really important. It made, you know, it changed or challenged or whatnot, oh, but it doesn't it. fit the, the full narrative that we're telling. There's here, so right? many, the advertising alone is a subplot, and there's yeah. so many ads that tell, they encapsulate, they show the product, mm -hmm. and they show how the product's being sold, and you get a sense of where the brand perceives itself and where it wants to go, yeah. and how it wants to get in your head. And really looking at those isolated diving in there's so many amazing ads that sometimes we pick one from an era or one from a from a marketing line when really you'd, you'd wish you could show more to really thing, it's yeah. i mean just that alone is its own book. Well, what if we go the other way with that one I mean, what if we just take those together and we just go around a college campus for advertising things and just have it be a, a segment i mean i'm a, I'm a marketer by trade uh, we yeah. could go and do some talks and just i bet we could get some professors who invite us in for a 
a little guest lecture on the ads and talk well, about it. Well, we, we had joked at one point, we have, we, we have literally so many ads in our archive. I mean, again, only a small portion made it into this book. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we had joked about doing a Volo's book of ads. I mean, like it, <laughs> we, we, could, we could fill a whole book with D&D ads, literally, from 1974 to, to present. I feel like Volo could make a buck on that, he'd do it. He would. <laughs> he would. So, he wouldn't even care if they were our ads, be like, Oh, that was for Conan the Bar. Just change Conan to D and D. It's so cool. but ads, ads impart so much. They show you so often um, the people that that you're trying to identify with yep. as your yeah. consumers, yep. right? And so they say, oh, these are the kinds of people playing, and it varies so much. I mean, you know, when when they wanted to make this a more kid-focused brand, you see kids playing. Yeah. When they were concerned that now we've got too much kids, you see then suddenly it's teenagers, you know, or yeah. like, moving you know, to Morley after the Satanic Panic, yeah. or almost trolling people that play, uh, were playing PC games at the time, making them look like the isolated yep. people alone, while oh, the D&D the people, they were partying together. Yeah, so that's right. So there's like the psychology to the ads. That too. was one of my other uh, contributions to 5th uh, edition, by the way, was my um, my major complaint on 4th edition. I said, I can't drink more than two beers and play 4th edition, because I won't remember crunchy. any of the yeah. things that are stacking. Like, I just, <laughs> it'll come my turn and I'll be like, what? I don't, I, sorry. <laughs> I have this plus this, so I'm like, you, you've got to be, it's got to be, if you want it to pop with everyone, it's a social game. You can't make it so that, you know, if you uh, are playing all night and stuff, that as you're getting tired and as you're getting the thing, that all of a sudden the game becomes less fun, yeah. right? Like, you got to just embrace. I mean, and, and time has a way of flying when you play the NBA, right? I mean, you're like, oh, oh we're going to get together yes. and play for a couple hours. You're like, it's 2 a.m. No, And you're really. always pushing your friends, like, just one more hour, and someone's like, oh, more, I gotta get up at seven, more. you just wanna go But if it's fourth edition combat, literally, like, four kobolds will take nine hours. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's... Just, <laughs> well, I'll then never... you get the higher levels, I mean, once you get above oh. seven, then you're like, all right, I'm gonna go make uh, a pizza, <laughs> you, right. you fin tell, call me when it's my turn. <laughs> but that's the other part, too, right? Like, And that's one of the interesting things, I noticed one of the pictures you had, and there was an advertisement for uh, a virtual table. Mm -hmm. um, ah, yes. and, uh, and so that comes up, and we have partners that do the virtual tables and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and those are great, especially when you can't be uh, in the room together. But we've always looked at electronic aids. You know, D&D Beyond is a great tool, uh, but it's not really meant to really kind of be played, uh, you know, like played off of. Yeah. Uh, and so when we were looking at it, one of the things that we want to make sure is that if you are together in the same room, that we're connecting and storytelling. And that's the other thing I think that fourth edition was tough is that because you know you kind of went along and you were so powerful and so great and you did all your stuff that I'm like, cool, I'm not really that interested. So then I didn't even get to know your character as well, right? Yeah. Like, because I'm not paying attention. But now the story parts is usually how you tell about your character and I think it gets it more interesting. Uh, totally. I like your one guy who takes uh, credit for uh, the, everyone else is he's like a, he's not even oh, a yeah, it, was a, it was a gnome wizard I, I'm a, I was a cleric a tempest cleric and he would claim that he did the call lightning and he was like it's not even one of your things but everyone in the party was so stupid they believed that he was the one raining down call lightning and See, killing even creatures that's my favorite part right yeah. because they would totally he would cast invisibility disappear yeah and then show up at the end of battle and claim that, that look at what did. I've done Yes. Yes. I mean, I mean, and so, so really to, to narrow down on, on the specific question, I, I would say, I mean, again, there are thousands and thousands of resources yeah. that we have. Um, so honestly, quite a, at the end of the day, what, if the narrative couldn't any longer accommodate it, we would, of course, yeah. trash it. Um, I mean, John's archive alone is has got so many extraordinary things that you know uh, it would have been hard to know where to even start. But again, we also didn't want to be too bookish. We yeah. didn't want to be too, yeah. I mean, I know it looks like a textbook, but we didn't want it to actually be a textbook, right? Yeah, and there's right? really not that much writing in it, per se. I mean, there is because you guys have gotten so many pages, but uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's like the amount of writing if it was, you know, 100 pages less. It's not. Uh, oh, absolutely right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, one question that, uh, that popped up out of here, uh, and I'm going to add something um, uh, to it just to make it uh, a little bit different. So uh, Jack's not so funny. How long did it take to curate all the historical information, artwork, and write this impressive book? I'm going to ask, though, that you go with one that you officially started, not the unofficial curation, because you kind of curate as a hobby. Uh, you probably been doing your head. You do it in your head. But like when you guys got together and started this project, how long ago we was had, that? We had an idea of a book, uh -huh. and then we set the book up to make it, and then we said, well, what is the book? And that's when I think it, that's when it re I would say we really started is when our conversation started about what is the book? Is it an art book or is it a visual history book? Yeah. We had a panel last night and that was a big thing we, we discussed is what differentiates and and I think um, we wanted it to be more encompassing than just art. Yeah. It had to tell a story and it's, it's the ephemerized product, it's everything. I think that's more comprehensive. So when did that and that was about, solidify? was that March? Uh, that was about January of 2017. January 2017 yep. and we met up in March 
Okay. Uh, yeah, March or maybe in February. Yeah, right. Your house. February. Yeah. Okay. And by then, everyone had kind of we'd been assembling images yeah, we'd all and been folders, folders, and we could put them up on a screen and go through thousands of them. And John yeah. was John was like also at the the lectern going through a couple <laughs> extra things that we'd never seen before yeah. too. And yeah. so there was a lot to discuss and then make decisions. And that's why what was important is why why a team. And Sam yeah. Whitworth, who's not here, which is Michael's brother, who you know from many TV shows, and he's Darth Maul and, and, and on, on uh, The Clone Wars and Han Solo. He's a big D&D &D fan. He's, he's one of the other writers. We all got together, and we then had a conversation, and that, that conversation then comes across in the book yeah. because what it is is juxtaposing art together, and it's putting product next to advertising. It's putting the people next to the, the work they created, and it led to uh, a discovery that he might have seen things one way, I saw things one way, Sam grew up experiencing it one yeah. way, and we all brought that to the table and then talked about it. So there was this whole discover rediscovery process, looking at art you'd never seen in new ways. Yeah. Then there's oh, the physical cool. writing process, which took you know, a little bit of time, and then there's yeah. the process of layout. And we knew that once we hit layout that we had to... Um, rewrite the book basically from scratch. Once you started putting images on pages and seeing them, not con not conceptualizing, oh, there's going to be an image here, and uh, we're going to put a little image here, about a quarter of a page. Oh God, you had to actually do this. it and realize this needs a full page. This needs here. We don't even need this, but wow, we totally need this one. Everything started to change again, and that was like a year and a half. Now, was this well, yeah, I mean, one graphic designer working on this, or did you guys have several? Were there rounds? How did it, what's I mean, about that? Part? I think we tortured one, one well, person. We did. We did. <laughs> poor, Lizzie, poor Lizzie Allen. Watching, we're sorry. Uh, yeah, yes. props to Lizzie Allen over there. Um, <laughs> yeah, she was dynamite. Uh, so th she was the she was the lead graphic designer. And of course, we also there was also uh, design help from a fellow named Paul Keppel uh, at a at Headcase Design Studio out out east, I believe, in Philadelphia, uh, and some a number of others actually consulted professionally on this to yeah. to help us really put together all the right pieces. Um, and so what, I mean, what was important though, I, I, one thing I really want to kind of uh, flesh out on that question is, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So you start a book like this, and so I can tell you that I believe the first conversation Kyle and I ever had about this book, I know what he wanted. He said, Mike, I want to see the native art of all those original books, those wraparound covers. What does that stuff look like? That's what yeah. I want to see in a book. And we all want to see that. And you know, some of that stuff, we happened to know where it was. We actually knew where things like the DMG, the, the Dungeon Master Guide Sutherland cover was. We knew, uh, we knew the Basic Box cover, the, the, that Sutherland that's at, uh, at Wizards. We knew that, that Wizards had that. Um, we didn't know where a lot of it was. So there was, a, there was also there was already an unknown about, well, how much of this stuff can we actually get? We know it's in private collections. We, we have some ideas about who may own this stuff. Yeah. But then there was the notion of, okay, and then outside of that, what do you do? Well, I mean, at its basic level, a book of covers. I guess a book of covers could be, theoretically, a um, kind of a visual history. You show all the product, right? Well, that's not very dynamic or yeah. interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, what ended up happening is we figured out, as, as you get deeper and deeper into the project, <laughs> oh my gosh, I landed on the, the, a, a draft copy of this. this oh my gosh, I found this. Yeah. And so this was literally happening up till about a month past close content date. So again, 10 speed props to you because we, we were giving them nightmares because things would start flooding into our inbox from places that we never thought would pan out. So good. And, um, and we really, we, we were uncompromising in terms of what we would take and use because we, we just knew it had to have everything. And, and we, did, we did get it there, I think. Now can I ask you kind of an uh, uh, inside baseball question? Did you go to the North uh, Texas uh, show that you do and like talk to friends and be like, okay guys, I need the scoop. Who's got this? Who's got this? Because that's a treasure trove of information sure. there, right? Yeah, so in the collecting community, it's important that we got plugged into them, obviously. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, I, I, I'm a collector. Now, I don't collect art at all, though. Oh. But I know the people that have the art right, stuff, right, right. right? Because we compete on other things. And you know, there's, there's kind of this friendly rivalry, I guess, right, among right. the people who do this. And so it isn't hard to surface information from those people. We make deals with each other all the time with nice. these things. And so, yeah, we, we were lucky to, I think, have a good head start. And then, yeah. like I said, you just, you know, if you show up, um, you, you fly around the world, you ask the right questions, you, you'll end up eventually getting the windfalls you need to, to get the content that you want. And, you know, and if you start where, um, where you're able to start, I mean, it, you know, you can start a project like this with a lot of confidence when you know people like Bill Meinhardt. Right. When you know people yeah. like uh, Matt Coder, who we actually didn't know very well at the beginning of this project, but we, we, we got to know through this. People like Paul Stormberg. I mean, there, we did know a lot of the right people that we felt confident at least that we could walk into this and get really valuable stuff that people would want to see. We, we actually never dreamed we would get everything we thought we, we ended yeah. up getting. Yeah, that's amazing. I, uh, 
again, I mean, every time I look at this, I, I think it's amazing. Um, i seeing the pictures on the computer, but now seeing it here, I don't know. Whenever something becomes a product, it feels so it's much just, cooler. It's great. It's rewarding. Yeah. And I, I work know. in film by day, and there's so much unrewarding, intangible BS. Yeah. And you develop something over and over again, and there's so many egos. And this, we put our egos aside. We just said, well, let's write and find, it's like a shared voice. You know, mm -hmm. we were like, how is this going to work if everyone has a different style? But <clears throat> once you have the shared vision, you just do it together. And that's what's great about it. And then you make this physical, tangible product you can hold in your hands, and, it, and it's great. And it's, I mean, we're all very, very proud of it because we didn't leave any stone unturned, and we just had amazing partners <laughs> like you guys. Oh, who's that? And uh, one of our, uh, our biggest uh, spokespeople right now. Uh, and then I will tell you guys a story. Uh, this is a, a Jeff Easley that was painted specifically for Joe uh, for his birthday, Christmas. They're kind of all around the same time. Uh, and so Sophia, being the wonderful wife that she is, and putting up with his uh, just straight up addiction to this hobby. Uh, I mean, he has more minis down in his thing than uh, most people dream. Uh, WizKids hooks him up with a lot of that stuff, and he's got them all like lined up and alphabetized. He pops and open and, the glass yeah. cabinet, and behind there is just like 700 beholders. So <laughs> Sophia, Sophia had this uh, um, commission specifically working with uh, with Jeff and Richard, uh, which is one of our art directors, helped her, you know, kind of tell them about Archon and explain and do the stuff. But this just like there was, it was, it had to like spill out of the room so now he's taking over like the next room outside of the Gary Gygax Memorial Dungeon. Oh, nice and hologram piece out there. Yeah well that was a that was a present from, from me. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Um, can I ask questions on the back? So on the back of the book I noticed you got some um, some quotes from people. Uh, so let's talk about these folks. Um, so some people may uh, know James Gunn. He's working right now. He's busy on a film that everyone's interested in. So you got a quote from him. You got a quote from John Romero, one of the most famous names in video games, right? Yeah. Uh, Deborah Ann Wall, who have you heard the story that she used to like make her PAs and her makeup art? Like she taught them to play D and D on the set, so that she had people to play D and D with when That's she was because awesome. she films out in New York and she's in LA. She's got like three different group shoots running yeah. D&D &D with it. She's actually like teaching new people one by one yeah, how to play, so she's guy. got players. She's wonderful, yeah. Matthew Mercer, we know that guy. <laughs> yeah. um, Adam F. Goldberg, uh, that dude is a super geek. He uh, yeah. is a producer behind uh, the Goldbergs, obviously, and a lot of other He wrote my things. second movie I directed, Fanboys. Adam's the writer of that. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, well, he uh, got on the phone with Liz because of the fact that they submitted a script for a uh, Goldberg episode, and we told him, no way. We're like, not a chance, you can't have permission, because we thought they were making fun of D&D. &D. Uh, and because the show is kind of a satire show, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and so Adam uh, Goldberg gets on the phone with Liz for like a half an hour explaining, like, no, this was me. This really happened. I love D&D. &D. I would never make fun of it. I did the, like, he's like, yeah. I'm poking fun yeah, of me, but really not. The, and so, like, talking, we were like, oh, okay, well, I mean, if you're just a straight up real geek and you're not poking yeah. fun, go ahead. Um, that was fun. Ernie Klein, obviously. Must be a huge fan, obviously a huge fan of Gary Gygax, so that's just littered throughout the book. Yeah. Uh, now, Amy Hennig? I don't know Amy Hennig. She's from the uh, director behind the Uncharted series. I love games. those games oh, so much. Oh, they're yeah. so yeah. good. Yeah. So cinematic. Yeah. D&D was a very big part of her life from a very uh, young age. That's what got her into storytelling, and so I got to know Amy, and she heard about the book <clears> and wanted to... Add a little check it out and she, yeah, and, she loved and, what and she again, saw. It's, it, it's in part it's, it's just showing the kind of people yeah. that grew up playing this game or, or, the, or it later adopted it I mean the kind of creative people in every different industry yeah. um, kind of doing different things and kind of are now the, the master of the generation right I mean it's kind of an amazing story really and creative and fun and talented people yeah. who I love playing D&D with yeah. I got to play D&D with James Gunn were you there on that night? Where I was not you? there no. oh. uh, so he played he played Star-Lord he didn't say his name was Star Lord. He was playing a dragonborn, like two, uh, two <laughs> fighter. Uh, but it was an orphan, and I forgot like his other story and stuff. But that's all of a sudden I'm listening. I'm like, you're just playing Star Lord. But he played it well, and he's a really fun and creative guy. And I love, I mean, you know, the beautiful thing about your guys' world specifically is that all the people that you play with. I mean, the, the guys around your table alone, just these, you know, talented, you know, fun. Uh, storytellers and everyone gets it's into a great the, outlet. Yeah, yeah. It's so great. And it's for me, I just sit there and I go, "Wow, I really feel like a fraud, but I'm also super happy to be here." You know, yeah, if you've seen like Ready Player One, the movie, you know, Ernie, <coughs> it's one of the biggest things in his life, and in the book, 
it's yeah. Tomb of Horrors. Yeah. Uh, it's a little different in the film, but you yeah, still, you still got the D and D iconography in there, and, and but it had to be in the film because it was just a big part of the. Of well, the, yeah. I mean, there was a great novel. shot in Entertainment Weekly before they released anything. The first shot they released, you see the Tomb of Horrors, the newer Tomb of Horrors one on the back of this thing because we worked yep. extensively with the uh, uh, people behind the scenes on that. I mean, we yeah. sent them all kinds of stuff. There's products. Cool. They probably have second best collection now. Um, <laughs> so it's fun. I'm really enjoying it, and, uh, and I'm, I'm getting to know Hollywood little by little. Uh, thankfully, you guys take me under your wing and, and introduce me to people and, uh, and let me... You always love it when you come play. to town. Yeah, it's fun, right? I'll make, we, I'll make soup or chili. Because we play games and because we talk and because uh, the fans are all really real. You know, and that's the part, too. You go around and talk to all these people. I mean, it's not a like for them. It's a love. And so yeah. when you ask and you want to talk about it, probably your trips are just a little longer than normal people trips because they want to tell you for four hours. And since they're letting you take a high res photo of a thing, you're not going to say no. And so you hear about the first game they played, what their, remember, like everyone wants to talk Someone about asked me about story. Joe, and like, is it a hobby? I'm like, is it, a, it's not a hobby. You know you, Joe yeah. would rather do D&D seven days a week than yeah. probably anything. <laughs> and that's why it's usually, so great. And know? we usually start earlier with Joe because the games end up going for six or seven He likes hours. to start at four or five o'clock. So yeah, because well, yeah. he wants to make sure it doesn't go till 2 a.m. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but, you know, Miles has to go tell two ways. I believe that. <laughs> and, but it's such an immersive hobby. I mean, that's one thing that, that we think a lot about, the, just the notion that we believe, partly because it's interesting to us, but we think that anyone that's interested in this hobby, it's so immersive, you're going to care about what that first beholder yeah, looked like. I you're going to care about Even what... if you're new to it and you're just casually interested, yeah. it, it's just mind-blowing to watch, to see like the idea of something. that Someone had this in their head, yeah, this yeah. idea of a game that was... So far ahead of the game compared to anything out there. Like when you think what was out there in gaming, it was Pac Man or Monopoly and Little Tokens and all these concepts that were in Gary and Dave's head. You know, how it manifested into something like this that inspired all these artists and all this product. Well, and, and it brought so many more people into the community. Gaming yeah. was a much more insular, it was almost entirely yeah. a male phenomenon then. And Super you nice look, to see that's not the case. Huh? Well, when you yeah. look at the numbers, I mean, you really see D&D had a very direct impact on this. Yeah. You know, the, the only ways we're going to kind of measure how big the, the gaming community such as it was before D&D was, you see numbers like, you know, half a percent of the people in it were women. And then D and D hit it. You know, it started to get to five percent, ten percent. I mean, I hear now figures like forty percent. Is that we're right? creeping up on it? Is we're that, like yeah. thirty-seven, thirty-eight percent yeah, now. Yeah. So we haven't done a um, we haven't done a survey in a while. So we've got our newest survey coming out soon. We're hoping to get wow. up there. I mean, my goal for it as the you know kind of the I guess the lead steward. Uh, you know, I'd like it to be just whatever the population is that we're selling that thing. So in yeah. the U.S. right now, I think if we get to fifty-one percent female, then you know then we'll know we're doing a better job. Um, but we're getting close. We're getting better. Um, you know, but the big thing about D&D um, that made me fall in love with it, and I think that when you see these different images and all this stuff, is that, uh, you know, we we don't want to show the marketing image of the, hey, we need one Pan-Asian, one black, three girls, blah, blah, blah. We try to just show the, the real people sitting around the table. But we do strive to get to that marketing mix or whatnot because I think it's, uh, you know, it's emblematic of what you, you yeah. hope for the game. Uh, but we try to be really kind of true about what we're showing. And so right now, you know, it's a little bit, I don't want to say shameful, but it, it's, a, it's a, a notch that we have not done a better job getting a little more color uh, in the game. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't, um, uh, you know, why the organic spread hasn't been um, kind of boundaries a little bit more on that. So then we have to look and say, okay, well, what are we doing wrong? Like, what things could we be doing better uh, in the thing? Maybe it's something about just the straight up way we're doing the pictures. Maybe it's the fiction of the fantasy. Maybe it's this. So we're trying to get better on all that stuff. But, um, you know, luckily, again, we've got all these people like you guys and Joe and anyone we, you know, are talking to with Gary Khan and Game Hall and Gen Con and all different things who are, like, helping us make it better. Because we listen a lot. You know what I mean? And I think well, that's and, the... Yeah, and, and uh, Mike and Jeremy are so great on social media about oh, inclusivity. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, Mike has no patience None. for, like, anybody that is telling you yeah. that this is not the game for you. Yeah, because that's not really our <laughs> mantra. I mean, yeah. and don't get me wrong. I mean, it's funny, right? Because we're super inclusive. We want everyone, uh, you know, unless you're going to make someone feel unwelcome, then we don't exactly. want you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'll say, not to be too much of a Wizards commercial, commercial, but one yes. thing I have to say, um, you know, as soon as Wizards picked this game up, they were thinking about the notion of inclusivity. They were thinking about the idea that even something as simple as a class limitations table yeah. actually limits you and actually can have kind of social implications beyond yeah. the game. So all of a sudden, well, if you want to be a half orc paladin, well, you can. Yeah. Because it's third edition. And again, so once, ever since Wizards picked up this game, they've been thinking about this very notion, the, even the idea yeah. of showing 
uh, races, male and female. Let's. This is for everybody. This yeah, is yeah. not just a male game. That half orc paladin painting too. That's one that Peter Atkinson kept. Uh, oh, really? He has that Still himself uh, at the Gen Con office because he loves how that possibility was opened up. In I did edition. wonder how many pieces he uh, personally had because he was obviously a big, big, big fan from early. I mean, when they got the chance to to buy it, it was definitely one of the greatest things that could have happened to the brand because it fell into great hands. I mean, it yeah, didn't go it, from it really TSR did. to someone who was like, oh, we can make a buck here. This yeah, was yeah. Peter was waiting. I mean, he would have bought it sooner if they would have sold it sooner. And, and probably for more. <laughs> <laughs> he would have. Yeah, I'm sure he would have. But, but uh, I mean, so and Wizards has been thinking about this from the very and I, and so I would say that you're, what you're su suggesting is that it sounds like you're doing a great job and you, you know there's still more work to be done, which is always the right yeah. direction, right? Yeah, yeah. we've still got some stuff, but uh, yeah, but we try hard and we try to listen hard. And you know, when someone calls us out on something that we, you know, I mean, if you're calling us to the, to the table uh, because of something we've done, we'll own up. I mean, we know we're not perfect, so we just usually try to be like, all right, we'll try and work on that. Yeah. Uh, but we try to do fun stuff. We try to um, get out in different places. This has been really fun and eye-opening being a bait. This is what I call a cool kid store. Yeah. Um, so this bear cool. bricks and everything that, uh, you know, are uh, kind of their own nerd and a different thing. Uh, and the shoes downstairs and all this kind of stuff. And you kind of don't expect you know, maybe necessarily D and D in here, but they're lying out the door for Joe's yep. merch and everything yeah. with and, rolling and this, deep. Yeah. You know, and these are you stuff, know, man. these are selling people down there. I'm yeah. asking them. They're D and D fans. They start telling me all I'm about their that. stuff, and they, uh, you know, and they look a little it's different good. than the normal. Software. So we, uh, you know, we're handing out dice, giving away cool stuff, and uh, I'm enjoying it. But so I mean, so I mean, actually, I don't. I've never had a chance to ask you this question. So why is D and D it right now? Why is it the thing? What, like, what's going on from Wizards perspective on this? Uh, well, number one, it's always the fans because you can't do it without the fans being awesome and because the community is like as great as they are about accepting and actually um, moderating their own things so if someone tries to come in. So the, so the fans have just created a community that's really open and accepting. Yeah. Which then people are like, of course I want to be here. But they're also the ones recruiting, right? So fans want more people to play with so they get that. So it's the fans. But I think the harder question really is like, why is it more popular than ever, right? It's always been a fan and a community driven game. Uh, and I think it's three parts. Uh, I, and I think it was a perfect storm. Uh, I think that we started working on the best edition of the game ever, and we tested the hell out of it with hundreds of thousands of people as long as it took. Yeah. We didn't pick an end date until we had been in, uh, we didn't pick an end date until we were more than a year into the playtesting because we didn't know until yep. we were there. I actually did my D&D &D Next playtest here at Comic-Con. You did? You were doing it. Yeah, nice. this is where I did it. D&D &D Next. Uh, I'm in, yeah. That, uh, that was your pin. That was so actually, yeah, that, we, that was my pin. Uh, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> we, we started making what is the, you know, the, the best edition and, and with the biggest goal of we didn't want to splinter anymore. If you play D&D, &D, you should be all one tribe. Exactly. Um, so that was the goal in the, in the brand. Now, combined with that, we've got just the explosion. Comic-Con is a great example of the explosion of geek culture, right? So this being at our heyday here uh, at, the, at the height of it. Uh, and then I would say, and obviously we've got, you know, with that is Tolkien and Game of Thrones and Peter Jackson's version of Tolkien, all those things kind of so yeah. geek and fantasy specifically just exploded. Harry Potter, and magic, Absolutely. it was just became something that was in the Yeah, the so you had culture. this sphere, so you had us making this really great product uh, you know, and resetting in the 40th anniversary and having this great celebration platform. Uh, that going on in fantasy, and then I believe that these devices that I have two of here uh, are the biggest thing that helps tabletop. Yeah. Uh, because I think that people spend so much time doing this that they want this. They yeah. want. Yes. They want to talk. They want to play together. It's decidedly together. analog. Yeah. And, uh, every digital game talks about open sandbox, but there are barriers built yes. into it. There so has to be. And D and D is the only game I think that's out there that doesn't have those and those barriers. You and can so do it anything. Encourages you to get together to stretch the boundaries. To Collaborative you. storytelling. <clears throat> so you get those three things kind of just exploding at one time, and I think it just makes this unprecedented time for D and D to. I mean, this is. So 2018, spoiler everyone, this is gonna be our best year ever. <laughs> last year was our best year ever. So last year was the best year. The year before was almost, but not quite, but last year was officially the best year in, uh, definitely under Hasbro, but wow. from everything Kurt and I could piece together, ever. Um, and then this year, I mean, we're, we're, you're gonna do very well. Unprecedented yeah. how much growth there is year over year on this. How many new players are coming in? I mean, we think in the United States alone that um, since fifth edition launched that there's uh, over four million new players who've never played D&D until fifth edition. 
Uh, so wow. that's just you know pouring in there. And then on top of that, how many people do you know that who haven't played in a long time and now they're back? Yeah, that's it. Right. I used to be a player. Oh yeah, I haven't played in a long time. Second edition. I'll check it out again. You yeah. know, but I got to check it out and getting in. I mean, uh, Todd James. Uh, he was one of those guys. He used to play a ton when he was young, and then fifth edition, someone was like, "No, no, it's been like a pretty monumental jump. Like, I think you got to check it out." And he was looking. He's like, "I'm all in." And so we we did what we set out to do was to get every edition feeling like they had a nice yeah. seat at the table. And the the rules are eloquent. They're um, well thought out. Uh, Jeremy, Mike, Chris Perkins, Adam, you know, all Greg Tito, Bart, all the people on the team out there connecting with the community, being really approachable and being able to talk about that stuff. So if someone has a, a question or a thought that isn't spot on, we'll jump on it, right? Yeah. Anything. And then the other thing that we have to um, acknowledge is the uh, online and the, and the streaming, the yeah. Twitch and, and YouTubes, because now people can watch someone play D&D and go, oh, that's what it is. I don't need to know math. I yeah, don't have to read huge. the whole book to start you just playing. Just got to read those few pages about yeah. your class, or your, uh, or if you want to go and roll twenty, and or you want to go and roll twenty. And, and of those four million new people who came in, a lot of them probably grew up playing video games, right? Yeah. They're they just teach you the basics, like hit points, experience points. Yeah, level, they know half the lexicon when they come in. Now, that's right? the point. Yeah, that wasn't true in 1970, yeah. 1980, right? These these were things What's that were a hurdle point? to yeah. get people over. The AC. fact that you you grow up with that now, just as part of our cultural milieu, means yeah. that then you reach this moment where you're like, wait a minute. Like, I can take these tools back to the tabletop and have the story I want to have. Yeah. The story me and my friend. Only me and my friend sitting around this table have to like this story. Yeah, and it's whenever so you want to explain from, D&D to someone yeah. versus video games, you just say, you know in video games how there's never, ever a chance where they could put something behind every single door. You will come to a locked door in a video game at some point. Yes. And there's just nothing you can do about that, mm -hmm. but not in D&D, right? Yeah, and my favorite is, like, if it, well, if there's nothing behind that door, the DM's probably going to, like, make it really hard to get in, and you're going to be busting <laughs> through. And then you finally do, it's like, it's a coat closet. It's got a broom. Uh, it's got a dustpan, uh, and it's got some kind of weird hairs on the ground. I don't know. Like just that was it. And you're like, oh man. That was or you a just face checked a dragon. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you would do that one. Okay. Can I throw a mimic in there? Yeah. As I was say, the broom is the mimic. I was gonna say, yeah, obviously. obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh my god. Um, it's kind of hot up here, and I want to be a little bit uh, a conscientious of your guys' time. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, you guys give us another. Um, kind of pop for when's it going? Uh, it's pre-selling now, but tell them where to get what editions uh, and when it's going to be out, out for everyone to play with, uh, and give us the sales book. So October twenty-third is the street date for all editions. Okay. So you can get the this. This will be available at bookstores, Amazon, all online retailers. It's everyone's going to carry this book. It's a fifty-dollar price point, but like we said, you're going to be able to find it a lot cheaper. Find it cheaper now, and the you know yeah. it locks in. Um, this book as well is available October twenty third. This is inside of this one. This is the Hydro seventy four special edition clamshell cover with the posters, um, prints, and the Tomb of Horrors nineteen seventy five Origins edition module. Forty something. The teams off screen squeeing at that. And then uh, this is a limited edition. So when that one's gone, uh, so it'll be once done. it's it's gone, is it? Yeah, I mean that one. Um, we do expect that one to sell out. That is up to be a pretty limited. Print it's run, actually so. been, I think, it was selling better. In a, uh, it it maybe was after stream. I, it popped. I wouldn't be Everyone surprised like, that's already half sold out. Once they saw it, too, so it's, it's anyone is like, I, I want this. All yeah, this stuff. of course. Well, and people in the collecting community that I play with, they're like, oh, I initially got five of those, but then I saw your thing, so I'm buying five more. This is the problem, right? So th yeah. these will go. Yeah. These will go. I think um, it's, it's. I mean, everyone I hardly like. But that's mass. That's not just one uh, retail. You can so. get this right now on Amazon. That's anywhere as you well. can find anywhere this. Uh, and the wall supplies last. Not that bookseller. Anywhere. And Barnes and Noble, for example, also carries that. Yeah. I mentioned that because they, of course, have that, that third edition. Yeah, and so then there's the Barnes and Noble edition, which is limited in number. And it looks just like this same art, only it's inverse. It's red with black. Uh, it's got foil on it. And it's. Nearly the exact same book, except, except it has cool pull -ups. also yeah, available October 23rd. So everything has that yeah. unified street date. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. That is awesome. Uh, okay, well then, guys, everyone go out there and pre-order five uh, just to mess with the algorithm. At least five. Five yeah. is the minimum. That five is the minimum for the audience, uh, yes. and, then, uh, and then what we'll do here is we'll take a quick break, and then I will uh, talk to the team. Because I think we do have one more special guest, maybe or no. Yes, we have two more special guests. Awesome. Uh, okay, um, but you guys, thank you so much. I know we talked a long time, but 
Our I pleasure. could have talked more because I love this book. I love all the products. Thank you so. for the endless support, encouragement. Yeah, we, you're just been our, our best fan, and you, you know, know we love you guys. Thank yeah. you for including Likewise. us and everything. It's, it's great. We, happy. you know, it's we couldn't have done it without the yeah. unprecedented. And, and I, I hope and we can help the overall effort. That you know, again, uh, exactly what what you're trying to do is just we're trying to, um, you know, gender people this game and trying to help yeah. them understand. And, and we do believe that you know, the more you kind of know what what this history is, the more you'll love this game. Again, there's a lot to love here. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty neat history. It's a very humble history. That's so, fun. I love yeah. it. All right, so let's take a quick break, uh, and then uh, we'll talk to Satine here real quick on the camera. So everyone, if you want to stick around a little bit, uh, we got Satine and a couple of special guests. I think you like. Thank you for uh, watching, hanging out, doing stuff with these guys. Uh, Thank and you. then follow them on social media, because they'll answer questions and geek out all day long. True. All right, let's take a quick break.
I love the two, one, I don't know. It's I'm informal around here, and besides that, uh, we're uh, in the middle coming back from our break, but, uh, but the guys behind the cameras uh, are great. They've been super pros. Pelham's back there, what I like to call supervising, but these guys, uh, they know what the hell they're doing, and they got equipment back there. So thank you guys very much for all the help on the streaming. It's been really appreciated. Uh, so we're back from break. Uh, we have some new faces here. What a surprise. I said we were going to have some special guests. Uh, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself. So we'll start with you, TJ. Hi, I'm TJ Storm, actor. I'm Jason Lyles, also actor. Oh, this one. I'm Jason Lyles, also actor. You can do whatever you want. I think they're all I really okay. I feel like you guys should introduce yourselves in a different way. Okay, TJ goes first. Uh, well, wait a minute, but what about this? this oh, is yeah, we're not done. No, 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 not just set team. This is time. fantastic. Well, yeah. how, if, if we were to do it in a different way, what might that sound like? Mm. Yes, why don't you give us your bio, because I don't even know what you'll be able <laughs> so to do. So this pick. is Godzilla. Oh, is that how it's yeah, going to yeah, be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so wait, I didn't know the Godzilla you, thing. Yes, I uh, do uh, normal acting, as well as something called performance capture. Uh, they also call it motion capture. Mm. You put a suit on, and the suit is covered in markers, the and then and computers turn us into whatever they want with the digital makeup process that they kind of do. Uh, wow. So I've done Godzilla. I've done um, Colossus and Deadpool. Uh, oh, nice! I didn't know that. I've been Iron Man, Baby Groot, Teenage Groot. I've I've gotten to do lots of different parts and lots of different things, and uh, I'm really lucky to be a part of all of that. Well, but the funny thing is, you've also done big giant monsters, but you're not motion capturing, well, right? I have. I've done both. I've done practical and, and performance capture, and so we actually know each other because we're both on the SAG after performance capture committee. Boom, yes. boom. And we're both huge nerds, but I okay. most recently, I, I'm George, that, that very handsome albino gorilla next yeah. to the rock so and on Rampage. Rampage. You're yeah. his buddy, right? Like, That's me. I'm, I'm flipping off everybody and making making jokes and saving the world. So, yeah. but you're in... The like that's yes. that's that's that's, well, that's not the animal. Yeah, it, that that's performance capture. Like he said, there's dots all over the body. There's dots on the face, and I had arm extensions. So I'm I'm walking, running, galloping, smashing everything. It's my voice, and and they take that. Weta does in, in this instance, and they turn me into a photorealistic ape. It's absolutely incredible. Do you um, see why I needed them to introduce themselves <laughs> like that? Because yeah. that's so cool. That's insane. <laughs> it's so much fun. I, I've done that. I played Ryuk and Death Note. And um, I, I may or may not have have some hand um, in in something in, in a Godzilla-ish thing. You know, I don't know. Oh. We'll have to see. Oh. Yeah, there's rumors. There's rumors. Yeah. Now, uh, obviously, we don't want to spoil anything. We're not supposed to spoil, but uh, or, go, or go missing in a trunk or something. Yeah, but we have a lot of discussions <laughs> in uh, in our place about um, who should win in a fight, King Kong or Godzilla. Okay. Uh, and uh, and we have a lot of Godzilla fans in the office who mm. think that they should totally. That obviously it would be Godzilla, but that's not necessarily uh, the the fan favorite, right? I mean, the, the norm is everyone kind of thinks the Kong should win. I don't think there is a norm. I think it's yeah. just like our political process. It is highly polarized, and there is this camp, and there is that camp. We've just, just lost like, all of our viewers. <laughs> We well, it depends politics. which Kong. <laughs> like, yes. which Kong as well? Is it Peter Jackson's 35-foot Kong, 25-foot yeah. Kong? Is it Kong Skull Island's 100-foot Kong? Yeah. Uh, it, there, it's which one, yeah. Uh, I will tell you guys a random story real okay. quick. I won't take it away because uh, they get to talk to me all the time. Um, but a buddy of mine uh, used to promote a thing called Kaiju Big Battle. Okay. Are you guys familiar with this? I've heard about it, It's yes. a super East Coast thing because it started out of these two guys out of Boston, and it's monster wrestling. It's wrestling in a ring. It's live action yeah. wrestling, but they're wearing monster suits. That and the reason awesome. that they uh, did this is because one of the brothers uh, worked in Japan in the Godzilla studio making monster suits for all the movies and things. But he's gaijing, so he wasn't allowed to make oh, Godzilla. He was only allowed to make wow. the bad guy. So I, he, would, he never got to be the master mm. level <laughs> monster maker because he was uh, you know, a Westerner. And, uh, and so when he came back uh, to the States, they turned it into, and it was very WWF inspired That's in terms great. of the lots of, there was good guys, bad guys, Dr. Cube was the bad guy, Regiment, and they have all the things, and the uh, referee even had like a persona and stuff, and, but they would build a city in the ring, That's awesome. and when the monsters first came out, the city was whole, but That's as they were wow. fighting and throwing each other into it, it would be like a Godzilla fight. Wow. That's awesome. So, yeah, if you ever get a chance to see Kaiju Big Battle, because every that now and then, awesome. um, they did a thing at TwitchCon uh, this last year, I saw a bunch of Kaiju yeah, shirts running, and I'm like, what? Yeah, so they're getting big again. It's fun. Uh, okay, uh, so you were at the party. You did not come out of the party, TJs, because we didn't invite you or you weren't in town yet. I was probably somewhere else doing something. Stuff. Else. Yes. There's a lot of stuff going on, yes. a lot of hustle. It, um, yeah. But you got to come to the party then. I did. What did you think of Z-Trip and that crazy mix? 
That was absolutely insane. I need to pick up like everything that he does. Was, I was, I want that so bad. I, 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 I have to say, I hadn't heard of him before. Oh, and Kyle, Kyle Newman, or uh, Joe Manganiello was telling me like, Z Trip, is this not insane? Oh my God. Amazing, amazing. Danceable that dude is incredible, metal. yeah. He's incredible. Yeah, uh, so I learned about him uh, about like 17 years ago. I worked at Xbox, and uh, the, one of the head guys at Xbox was a huge DJ Z Trip. So we did some live events, uh, Xbox Live, sorry, or online service events, and had him come DJ. And my mind was blown then, and so yeah. to Joe to be a buddy with them, and he lives near here in Carlsbad, and so they said, hey, we're going to get Z Trip. I'm like, that is legitimately my favorite DJ ever. Man, um, I was blown away. And then you hear him mix like the old records, the old uh, yeah. Hobbit and the old uh, D and D records, and he mixed it with uh, like Slayer. That's cool, seriously? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, no, it's yeah. legit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're gonna release the track he recorded. They're Yay. gonna release it, so it's, yeah, I don't know when. Um, so that was cool. And the other fun thing about the party is uh, Joe doesn't look short at parties very often. Nope. But uh, I look over, I'm like, who's that guy? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, who's that's, Joe? He's like six five. I think so. Yeah. And that's tall. But then I'm six nine. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, put, put, put it put my my chin on his head a little bit. Yeah. But he's 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 a lot bigger than I am. I yeah. He's yeah. A, he's yeah. a big dude. He's a big dude. You're kind you of know. a big dude. You uh, you work out a little or a lot? Ballet. 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 Tap. Mostly tap. Yeah. Yeah. On your hands. That's how you get the. <laughs> Uh, a lot of martial arts. A lot of martial arts. Yeah. Uh, and then um, you said you do motion capture and stuff. Do you have you done any movies where you're fighting and martial arting? Absolutely. Being, uh, being, like fantasy stuff. Oh, I love it. I, I love it. I wish I could do more fantasy stuff, but uh, I do a lot of martial art movies. Uh, a ton of them. I've worked with Jet Li. Nice. I've worked in Kickboxer Vengeance. Uh, okay. I get to work on a lot of fun stuff. Yeah. So I worked on Punisher War Zone. Uh, okay. Uh, for uh, Marvel, I was a character named McGinty, uh, and I had an Irish dragon. accent. Really? Dragon the dragon and face off, yeah. yeah. So Sig Neutron, yep. right? Yep, Sig uh, Neutron. Turned him into a dragon. Oh, good. Well, Sig is an amazing, if you guys don't know, Sig Neutron is an amazing makeup artist, and he was the uh, finalist on a show he called Face Off, and yeah. he won everything with the yeah. makeup that he did for us. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Spectacular killed, dragon. That was great. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, you've had some practice being a dragon, though, because you're also a dungeon master, right? Yes. Yeah. Have you guys played together? We haven't played together yet. yet. Not yet. No. But that's happening. We love Connected. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so are you running regular games? Do you have, like, a, a weekly thing going on? Or monthly, I have three or? games a, a week okay. right now. Do you DM uh, them all? Or are you DM. playing any? I DM all of them. I mostly DM most of the time. Yeah. Uh, and it is a absolute blast. How long have you been playing? Forever? Uh, at least 30 years. That's a long at least, time. At least, That's yeah. That's a long time. I love it. It's yeah. so much fun. I I've been doing be, anything for 30 years. I, I used to be in the back. I went to a, a school called Our Redeemer, and it had a chapel, and we had to go to the chapel once or twice a week. And sometimes the guy was up there talking, the pastor was up there talking, and if he stopped at the wrong time, we would, you could hear the, the sound of rolling dice. Yeah, and it was like, and it would echo, and everybody would like, it was just like, mm. so yeah. Yes. It, it's a great way to grow up, and yeah. it, it kept our imagination fresh, and we still do it. Critical role to you, and also to you. Yes. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. Now, Satine, have you ever played with CJ? I, we, we, we haven't played. Not yet. No. Really? However, he's going to be at the Jocks Machina table I at know. Founders and Legends. Uh, so do you know about this? Do you know what we're doing? I don't know what you're okay, doing. Okay, well, we're going to tell you, because okay. they know. Uh, so <laughs> Luke Gygax, yeah. uh, who uh, is Gary's son, obviously. So Gary's 80th birthday is coming up. I mean, uh -huh. he's passed away, obviously, but if he's still yeah. alive, he'd be celebrating his uh, 80th birthday in like a week, actually. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think it's Saturday. It's actually a week from yeah. today. Um, our fine folks at Critical Role have let us use their uh, brand new space. So they got this great space for streaming uh, games, and they're super awesome. And obviously, you know, they love Gary's legacy as much as we yeah. do, and so they let us use the place. And so uh, Luke uh, is uh, bringing uh, some old stuff that uh, has never been published. Uh, that I think Stefan Bacorny, who does all the Dwarven Forge, mm. so he's going to DM a game like an AD and D that's like old school, original, like very. And they we're calling the loop named it, but we're calling it Founders and Legends. Oh, you know, kind of reminiscent D and D, but also kind of cool. tribute. When, it, when is this? Where is this? Yeah, so it's Saturday in Burbank. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you next want. next Saturday, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my okay. gosh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So Joe's going to be there. You're going to be there. Um, I'm going to be there. Luke Gygax, uh, Matthew Lillard, I know is going to be there. I'm not sure who from Critical Role is going to be there, but I know someone might be. Um, and um, and who else is going to be? Are you going to? You're going to be there. I'm running the second game. You're running. Oh, Mike Merrill's is going to be Mike there, though, right? Is Mike Merrill's is going to be. Do you know what uh, Luke is playing at my table? 
What is Luke playing at your table? Jeremy Cropper is turning Melf into a character, his 5th edition character. Really? Yeah. I'm oh. so excited. Oh. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, so we're just getting a, a group of friends, and uh, and we're helping Luke, really. And this one's not really kind of a D&D thing. We're kind of more just like, how can we help? Mm. Um, you know, I mean, it's obviously, uh, um, you know, he's close to our heart. Gary, obviously, is, uh, you know, <laughs> formative. To uh, say yeah. the least, yeah, uh, and uh, and so it's a fun uh, live stream we're gonna do, and we're uh, tying a charity on to it. So every year, Dungeons and Dragons, we do a big thing with what's called Extra Life, uh, and so Extra Life is all around gaming and helping the Children's Miracle Network. Uh, so we raise money, people donate, and it's funny because really it's just an excuse to donate. All our fans are great and they want to help do it anyway. But so we like to run some special gaming, and then they you know donate bits as part of the, the kind of thing. Sometimes we'll make special builds that can only be played uh, if you donate or do the thing and get that. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's going on, and I know that now are you DMing or are you playing? I'm playing. I think. Oh, you're playing, playing the Jack's Mike Merrill's game. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> do you know what you're in for? I have no idea. Do you know that it's high, high level? Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I gotta read the emails. You do gotta read. The emails. <laughs> <laughs> but not many, not many of us get to play at 18th level. Oh, number one, because not many of us oh have characters gosh. 18th level. Number two, and you know this is a DM. You know this. I don't know if you DM. I'm like new DM. I'm, I'm, I'm not DM'd yet. Yeah. Yet. So uh, it's not as it's not as easy to DM it's, at 18th level. Yeah. Hey, Jason, what's up? Uh, and so, I know, I love this place. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so Mike Merrill's, of course, can do it uh, because, well, you know, him and some other people wrote the rules. Uh, but it's not an easy feat. Uh, and so it's pretty fun if you get an opportunity to, uh, uh, to DM uh, or play, even play at 18th level. Uh, now he's just gonna stand and look pretty because obviously not mic'd up. So lean into um, arm candy. <laughs> lean into uh, Satine's bosom if you're gonna say hi. But this is uh, uh, Jason, uh, who is playing Comic Con next door, right? You're playing shows. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. Playing shows next door at uh, ah. at uh, Moonshine Flats, a couple of blocks over. Oh my God, we have all the he's we have also all the good one of my people. Best friends, we have so all the good people weird. rolling in. Uh, and also speaking of voice act, I'll go. You guys were talking about performance acting in terms of suits and stuff, but obviously some voice acting in there uh, as well, right? They take your voice and ditch those. Uh, Jason is actually the voice of Dritzt uh, yeah. in the no, Neverwinter no, no, game. Right, so. Tour today. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, oh, and we so. got to have our moment. So yeah. it was cool. Yeah, oh, busy. Bob. I was trying to get Bob over here, but he's a busy dude. Uh, he's yeah. a busy dude. Uh, have you ever met Bob? So Bob Salvatore, R.A. Oh, Salvatore. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Salvatore. Salvatore. Oh, serious? Yeah. yeah. So Bo uh, Robert, and I forget what his middle name is, uh, Salvatore. Um, uh, but everyone who knows him in the office yeah. calls him Bob. Um, but Bob is from uh, from Boston, uh, and he's Italian, and he's got this like Boston <laughs> yeah. Italian kind of accent. Right. And when he was in college, I think he put himself through college being a bouncer at bars That's in cool. South Boston. <laughs> and, yeah, so he's a he's a fun guy, and he uh, wrote Dritz. Do you know Dritz? Are you familiar with uh, Dritz Stewart? Dritz Stewart, and he's our dark yes. elf. Dark elf. Yeah, so he's been writing those ones for gosh, probably thirty years a now. Long time. Man. Yeah, uh, and he's got new books coming out now, and he's here. Going around doing the Comic Con thing for that the new Dritz books, awesome. so uh, that's great that they got to meet him. Um, what else is going on? I'm trying to think, but I'm super excited you're doing that uh, event. Do you know? Uh, I know you're teasing that you don't know it's high level. Do you know what kind of character you're going to build? Do you I, I'm playing with some ideas, but I'm not sure yet. And okay. now that I know it's 18, yeah, I'm, I have a new set of thoughts. <laughs> well, you're probably going to multi-class, I would assume. Yeah. I mean, once you're going probably. up to 18, you're probably going to multi-class. Yeah. yeah. Well, once you use D&D Beyond, too, it helps a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. I, play, I DM'd my first 14th level game, and I thought that was intense with six players, mm. and everything was going good until we lost the internet, and then I, <sighs> I couldn't use any no. of the bad guys' spells. So it was a little bit Now they have easier. a mobile version, though. You're fine. It only has the um, books. Oh, well, they're fixing that soon. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> Yeah, they're rolling it out yeah. in waves and stuff. Because I'm addicted to, to it. Yeah. Like, no, like, I, I'm on it every day. Yeah. Yeah, nice. it's important. Uh, so that's nice. I don't know if you guys have used D&D on before, but, like, right now, if you guys want to play, I mean, I always obviously carry dice with me anyway, but uh, but I've got a uh, character sheet in my pocket, so, like, we're always ready to play now. That's oh, wow. perfect. Yeah, wow. so if you guys want to play some D&D, we've got a couple DMs here, you know. Let's rock. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you usually play? Uh, I'm. I have to say, I'm fairly new. I've only okay. been playing for about a year. I played okay. as a rogue, um, Me too. and I just got finished playing uh, as a cleric with some friends. Oh, cleric! Yeah. Oh, yeah, you've been a cleric totally pretty early. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I liked it though. It really kind of stretched me, and I had to learn a lot. Um, 
and it was it was a blast. It was to obviously totally different from a rogue. I mean, I've been playing video games my whole life, and I was thrown into D and D about a year, year and a half ago. And I just as soon as it clicked, and I le I saw, oh my gosh, I see what it is. I love this. I love we it. have to play this all the time. What do you mean you can't play next week? That's I love, love right. it. What do you I mean we it. can't play? No, no, let's keep going. What? It's two a.m. No. Yeah. yeah, but we're not. We're not to the. I know. Uh, we're in the middle of a game right now with Satine that we played like six or eight months ago. But we like we thought we knew what the adventure was about and then just about when we opened the door and realized we had no idea that we needed like tons of extra oh, it was gosh. like we can't play anymore like it's been six <laughs> hours we gotta put it. and so but we've got to get the whole group back together and yeah. then i've got a perkins game that uh is a similar one where all was like oh my god that was amazing and he's like i don't have any more in me i'm done it's and we're looking it's like it's one o'clock now what like, do you play what, what i play game? i always i my my go-to character is a pastry chef so good. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So his it's, name is Ganache. Is no. Uh, which, if you know, um, uh, if you know That's baking, uh, That's it's awesome. a uh, it's a chocolate that you mix with sugar and. I didn't uh, know that there was a pastry chef. Yeah, there is. That. Yeah, uh, okay. we get a lot of. Well, I get some leeway though because I um, I sign everyone's paycheck. Okay. So if I say, hey, Mike, you know, we should totally have ball bearings in the player's handbook. Yeah. He's like, cool, ball bearings. That's you know, awesome. Yeah, That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, but yeah, so I, he's a pastry chef. Um, some people, Joe especially, will say that I don't have the hands of a baker, uh, and he thinks that he's like maybe a rogue assassin. <laughs> but the uh, funny thing is, if you were a rogue assassin, would you tell anyone? That That's right. the important part. Is right. excellent. Uh, that is true. Wow. And so I'm just, yeah, I travel a lot. I just kind of travel around. I've got um, a charlatan, and so my uh, background, you know, I've uh, got false identity. Uh, and so one of my false identity is like this, I was like the employee of the month. Uh, in uh, Lord Never Ember's kitchen, so the kitchen manager. I wasn't high up, right? I was just a, a dude, awesome. but I got was like the employee of the month. Uh, so that I've got that like you know thing. So if someone questions my, you is know, your drawing right there on the the kitchen door as uh, employee of the month? Uh, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> charcoal exactly. scribble. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I just because that's the funny thing, right? Like I like the role playing in it, and I like the uh, that's great uh, playing the thing. And I usually play a sneaky, stabby guy, but I'm always like, but I feel weird, just like leading Being out. Being the it. guy, yeah. <laughs> but I would feel weird playing a clerk because that's a. That's a pretty big support. I mean, that's a crucial role, right? Well, we just didn't have one. So yeah. it, and came, so you were the it, it came player. down to like, well, Aww. we need that. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. I've done that. And like in the video games, World of Warcraft and this yeah. and that, I could probably figure this out, right? And yeah. my, my roommate at the time, was he, he was hardcore into it. So I could take most questions to him. And he'd be like, oh, yeah. let me explain that. Let so, me explain that. Yeah. So I, I got thrown into it with some, with some pro players. Mm -hmm. So they were very helpful. Getting, I'm still learning. Obviously, after only a year and a half, almost two years, I'm still learning everything. But like, I just I nerd out for it. I nerd out for learning about it and how I can get deeper into it and stuff. I'm so DMing much. three games at the same time right now, and two of them are in the same exact dungeon. It's the Shrine of Tomochuan. Nice. And one group has That's a cleric. That's the U series. Yes, it's the Aztec. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Back. Uh, so one one group has a cleric. One group does not have any mm -hmm. support. Oh, oh my gosh. That's so one group is done, and the other group is three quarters mm. of the way and half dead. <laughs> so yeah. they're, going they're going a lot slower. Yes, they're going a lot slower. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Tapping every wall. Uh, we shouldn't go in there, guys. Yeah. <laughs> let's run out. Let's, yes. let's kite a lot. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's totally funny. different tactics. It's uh, really interesting. How many new players do you have? Is your a pretty veteran group, or do you, um, uh, do you guys about half group? and half? Yeah. I like to mix my veterans with the new people so yeah. that they can talk to each other. That mm. way, I don't have to do player stuff. The other players can help them along, and I can yeah. solely concentrate on my my side. Yeah. Now you guys all live in LA, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, have you guys noticed that it's pretty easy to find players for your groups in LA? Like, there's a pretty thriving D and D community. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we're lucky, awesome. very lucky. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're pretty lucky up in Seattle too. Some people forget how many, uh, but we've got like over 200 game developers in Seattle. Oh, wow. uh, and so, if you're programming video games, you probably also love to probably touch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's really great. Um, we're probably getting close to running over. Uh, I also. Uh, Jason, are you on tour soon, or are you going to be at the thing next weekend? I will be. Yeah, I'm going to be at the thing next weekend. Yes, awesome. Legends and... Are you at my table, Founders too? and Legends. I You're think at I'm at your table. table. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, so I'm not a founder, so that must mean that You're I'm a legend. legend. Yes. yes. Uh, 
Uh, but I want you guys all to pay attention to that. That is going to be epic fun, and it's for the kids. That one's got a charity element. We've got really fun people playing, really fun people DMing. Uh, I just finally got to meet uh, Luke uh, Gygax in person, but for those of you who don't know, uh, he's instrumental in, in Gary Khan, obviously. He's also a, 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 a person in the U.S. military right now. He's in the Army, uh, serving his country for a lifetime now. Um, really cool guy, obviously really proud of the legacy and, and what's going on and wanted to you know, do something to celebrate, and uh, we wanted to help him, so that's been great, and everyone comes together. So tune in, make sure you watch that, because that's going to be epic. Uh, there's three games uh, planned for it, and you've got kind of a first edition and then two fifth. Uh, edition. Well, it's more than that, though, because we're actually going to start off by doing, I think, an hour interview about like the history of Dungeons and Dragons oh. and like how it's affected all of our lives. Oh, nice! And then um, it's, I think, they're two-hour games, and in between each game, there's an hour of of interviews and content. So, so it's going to be a good day. Starts at ten and it ends at ten. Ten to ten. Mm -hmm. Saturday, ten to yeah. ten. We'll be back in 10 and 10. No, 10 and 10. <laughs> uh, So that's going to be good. So if you uh, haven't tuned into that, definitely tune into that. Uh, or obviously you haven't, but if it's not on your calendar, if you don't mark it on there, make sure to do it. Uh, pop in and out as often as you want there. Obviously, Pelham and everyone will get it posted up later on the on the VOD if you're working or if you're in the wrong time zone. We totally get that. Uh, but check it out. Uh, and then you can see these guys again. Maybe you'll come because I bet we can squeeze you in. I would love uh, I mean, to. you're kind of slender. I mean, you're super tall, yeah. but yeah. I can squeeze so, in. I think yeah. there is a spot, and I think I know exactly. You think you know exactly where? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then uh, and then also, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't forget, we're going to uh, pop in for one last Comic-Con thing tomorrow. But tomorrow we're going to do the format a little different. Um, Satine and I are going to get on there and kind of um, talk about some of our favorite parts from this weekend, uh, show, uh, you know, maybe we'll get some pictures together or, uh, and show some stuff going on uh, that we thought was really uh, emblematic. Are we slide showing? Uh, uh, we could, we could <laughs> a little bit. We could see if we could work that out. I don't know. We got some pros back there. Um, and then, uh, and then the girls from Girls Got Glory. And I always feel bad calling girls, and I told that to Kim. I'm like, I don't, you know, I mean, you guys are all adult women. I feel weird saying girls. She's like, no, that's our thing. We're girls. We're girls. <laughs> that's cool. It's cool. And she goes, so don't worry about it. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, are the girls coming? They're like, yes. Everyone uh, said yes. But then last minute, Sujata Day had to bow out because uh, you guys know working in L.A. that you get jobs. And when a job pops up, you got to jump in. And so uh, she's got some gig that certainly pays more than playing D&D. &D. But uh, that means that uh, we are without the uh, Ichabod uh, dwarf. Uh, so that's kind of a shame because... Uh, She's got wicked great eyebrows and, uh, and oh. ick a beard, they call it. Ick a beard? Uh, yeah, so, so Sajada, uh, you know, is a woman with long, dark hair, but she takes the hair and braids that it into a beard. Awesome. Uh, she does so like that, like a douche. Yeah, she looks good. Yeah, she's, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. uh, and she's a fighter and a lover. Uh, she's super funny. <laughs> I love watching her play. Uh, but I think the rest of the crew uh, is either here already down at Comic Con or, or is rolling in tonight. Uh, and then um, that is uh, Dungeon Mastered by uh, Kelly, uh, and so it should be a lot of fun. So tune in tomorrow morning. That one's gonna that stream's gonna start at noon. So that's gonna be uh, we're gonna go a little earlier, uh, end a little earlier. But I think it'll be a longer stream tomorrow because it'll be uh, the girls live playing up here. Um, we'll figure out how. Uh, everyone's nervous that it's gonna be really crowded. Science. Now. But yeah, I mean we got you know we got five right now. We'll get you know sevens. Uh, they're tiny. They're super tiny. They are very yeah. small. Yeah, I think I've got a D20 bigger than Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, but thank you guys uh, for popping in. I know it's kind thank of an impromptu, but I yeah. just love talking to me and it's awesome. Uh, so everyone, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for watching uh, the D&D Twitch channel and supporting us, and uh, you're awesome. Uh, we'll talk soon. <laughs>